This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 192nd episode of the program. Today is Friday, May 10th, and before we get into the show, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube contributors, all of which signed up to become a member for the first time this week or increased their monthly pledge, and that includes Adam Zayas, Andy P., Chris Ward, Dax McCoy, Devin the Deviant, Ellen Smith, Ensar Beckick, Hunter P., Jennifer Heinrich, John Jewell, Julian Lopez, K. Ken, Krishan Chander, Kurt Egg, Linda Corey, Ron Carroll, and The Critical Dump. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by visiting humanistreport.com slash support or by checking out patreon.com forward slash humanistreport and underneath any one of our YouTube videos, you can click join and that gives you access to some of our videos before they go live and you also support the show. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, we'll talk about the differences between Biden and Bernie when it comes to healthcare, why the electability arguments being used against Bernie Sanders are falling apart, a new UN report warns about a million species going extinct due to human activity, neocons in Trump's administration want war with Iran and Venezuela, Rachel Maddow's use of McCarthyism is now extending to legitimize John Bolton's regime change narrative in Venezuela, how the new anti-abortion heartbeat bills popping up in various states could very well be the death of Roe v. Wade. John Hickenlooper compares Bernie Sanders' policies to Joseph Stalin's. Republicans think Bernie is the most beatable 2020 candidate. And we'll talk about the second choice for Biden supporters. And that may surprise you, actually. And finally, we closed the week with my ranking of 2020 Democratic Party presidential candidates. And I'll talk to 2020 presidential candidate Mike Ravel. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today. I hope you guys all enjoy the program. So last week on the program, we talked about this rivalry that's currently brewing between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, specifically when it comes to the issue of health care. And according to a Washington Post article, Biden's team reportedly told Bernie Sanders team to, quote, bring it on when it comes to this health care debate which I think is foolish because healthcare is arguably Bernie Sanders' greatest strength. But nonetheless, they think that their guy, Joe Biden, can best Bernie here. Now, to give you an update, fast forward a week later, how is this going? How is this debate playing out? Is Joe Biden really communicating a more clear vision for the future of America when it comes to healthcare? Well, expectedly, no. He has completely and utterly face-planted because at a rally in Iowa, he had the chance to articulate his vision for healthcare reform in America. And here's how that went. According to Mark Caputo of Politico, Joe Biden has a healthcare plan but doesn't, quote, have the time to completely lay out all the details. Yet, there's time for relatively lengthy anecdotes about how his dad long ago was unable to secure a loan to help send him to a school he wanted to attend, and time to describe a New Yorker cartoon that hung in his office, or to praise President Obama to remember the untimely death of his beloved son, Bo, and a crowd favorite to bash Donald Trump. In other words, if it comes to platitudes and personal stories, Joe Biden has all the time in the world to talk about that. But when it comes to health care policy, a policy that is the number one issue for a large portion of Americans, he doesn't have time to talk about that. So what was the point of you challenging Bernie Sanders? Why did your team essentially instigate this debate and this rivalry if you don't even have time to lay out an alternative vision to Bernie Sanders because we all know Bernie wants Medicare for all and you clearly disagree with that so what's your vision he doesn't have time politics is about policy but he doesn't want to talk about the one thing that a presidential candidate 
theoretically should want to talk about. And to be clear, it's not just healthcare where Joe Biden is completely empty and vacuous because he also has a proposal for college debt, but no specifics on that either because, quote, I don't have time. I don't want to keep you standing any longer. He said this to a crowd of people in Iowa. The former vice president's ideas on climate change and foreign policy, also a work in progress. So he didn't choose to run because he has this policy agenda that he wants to implement to help Americans. He's running because to him, politics isn't about policy. It's about personality and persona. And him challenging Bernie just contributes to this narrative, this character that he's building, this straight-talking, no-nonsense, tough guy who will put anyone in their place because he's just so tough. But, I mean, in actuality, he's someone who doesn't care about policy, is completely devoid of substance, and people like him presumably because he just gives people the feels. That's it. He talks nicely, he talks about platitudes, and he makes people remember the time when American politics was a lot more stable during the Obama years. And to support Joe Biden, you tacitly have to admit, or even explicitly in some cases, that you actually don't give a damn about policy. And the reason why he has so much street cred, the reason why he's so arrogant and wants to challenge Bernie when it comes to healthcare, even if he doesn't even want to talk about healthcare, is because he has elites. He has cable news pundits and celebrities backing him up. For example, watch this interview with Alyssa Milano on MSNBC. She literally admits that it's not about policy, that policy isn't why she's supporting Joe Biden over everyone else in the field. You have, what, 20 plus candidates now? She's choosing Biden not because he has the best policies, because to her, policy doesn't really matter so much. Look, there's nobody in the world that wants progressive policy to be set in place more than I do. But this primary to me is not about policy. It's about beating Trump period. That's it. End of story. We need to nominate someone that is going to beat Trump um, and bring honesty and integrity and, and dignity and truth back to the United States of America. Empathy, compassion, all these things that I want to teach my, my children growing up in this great country. We need someone that's going to represent that to the best of their ability and, and, um, and fight Trump. And, and, you know, I can't, I, I, it's not about who's going to make the best president. It's a, really about who's going to beat this man, this horrible, horrible president. Now ask yourself this, why would someone like Alyssa Milano, who is seemingly intelligent, support someone, a political person, when they don't actually want clearly to lay out their policies? Well, think about it. She's comfortable. She has economic security. So regardless if Joe Biden or Donald Trump wins, she's going to be doing just fine. And this is why a lot of celebrities support these vacuous centrist politicians. George R.R. Martin, also supports Joe Biden, claimed that his introduction video or his announcement video, if you will, was completely kick-ass and he loved it. And ask yourself, why would someone like George R.R. R. Martin, who's clearly a genius, who's brilliant, who's extremely creative, would support someone as empty as Joe Biden? It's because he's comfortable. When you look at the net worth of these individuals, they are so comfortable that it doesn't matter to them what Joe Biden says he's going to do or what he's not going to do. They support him because he makes them feel good. Just hearing his voice really harkens back to the days of the Obama era when Democrats were in power. So the reason why these people don't care about policy and they don't care that Joe Biden is not talking about his ideas, they don't care that he literally said, quote, I don't have time to talk about health care, is because they're extremely comfortable. Now, if people actually looked past all of these analyses from celebrities and cable news pundits, they'd see that Joe Biden is nothing more than not just an empty suit, but a shill for the healthcare industry. Because when you look at reports from Vox, for example, it's clear that the healthcare industry is literally betting on Joe Biden to save their ass. They literally view him as a savior, basically the last choice or the last person who could save the country from Medicare for all. Juxtapose what we hear from the health insurance industry about Joe Biden and all the nice things that they have to say about him with what we hear when it comes to Bernie Sanders and how the healthcare industry responds to him. Well, we know that when he reintroduced his Medicare for all bill, Health industry stocks tanked. And on top of that, investors were shook. And insurance providers that offer Medicare Advantage plans felt compelled to increase benefits just to prove to Bernie Sanders, who they are terrified of, that they're not completely useless. And, you know, maybe they don't only care about profit. Maybe they're willing, under the right amount of pressure, to adapt and increase benefits. 
So that's how the health insurance industry responds to Bernie. Please don't kill us. But when it comes to Joe Biden, please save us. He's the savior. But yet, he can challenge Bernie to a debate on health care. And then the next week say, you know what? I don't have time to talk about policy. And he still gets support. It is unbelievable. Joe Biden is as vacuous as politicians nowadays can possibly be. And the only reason why this passes is because people still look to the Obama era with rose-colored glasses. They view it nostalgically. But I hope people will realize that Joe Biden lacks vision. He may seem like he's a tough guy. He may huff and puff. But in actuality, none of that means anything if he's not willing to be a tough guy and stand up to the special interests who he needs to stand up to. So, for example, listen to what Bernie Sanders says about healthcare. In an interview with ABC, he was asked about Medicare for all, and he described exactly what's wrong with Joe Biden's approach, because what Joe Biden wants is to maintain the status quo. Here's what Bernie Sanders says to that. Uh, Biden says that he would like to see a more incremental approach, fix Obamacare, provide a Medicare option for anybody, but allow people to still have, some, have private health insurance if they want. Why, why not do an approach like that? I'll tell you why because the system today is, is truly dysfunctional. Uh, we have 34 million people with no health insurance, even more who are underinsured. The drug companies are ripping us off every day, charging us the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And yet, at the end of all of that, Jonathan, we are spending twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country. That is a situation that really cannot be defended. You can't spend so much money and get so little value. Medicare right now is the most popular health insurance program in the country, but it only applies to people 65 years of age or older. All that I want to do is expand Medicare over a four-year period to cover every man, woman, and child in this country. It will save the average American a significant amount of money, give them freedom of choice with regard to the doctor or hospital they want to go, and substantially lower the cost of prescription drugs. But to do that, you would eliminate private health insurance in this For country. basic needs, yes. So what, what do you say to the firefighter in Iowa who has a health plan that, that they like uh, and, and doesn't want to give up the health plan? What I would say is there are tens of millions of people every single year who change their health insurance programs. Mm -hmm. They may leave their job, their employer may give them a new uh, set of policies, new company. Uh, and what I would say is that if you want stability, if you want a better program, a more comprehensive program, with no deductibles, with no copayments, with no premiums, which will cost your family less, support Medicare for all. But 180 million or so people have, have private insurance. But every health year, tens of, of them. But the only difference, and I look, we are taking on the insurance companies and we're taking on the drug companies. As you know, they formed an organization. They're going to spend tens and tens of millions of dollars trying to frighten the American people. The only difference that people will see in a Medicare for All as opposed to United Health. Now, the guy who runs United Health, I think, made $83 million in profits last year. And not in profits, but in personal compensation. Right. He does not like Medicare for All. I can understand that. The guy who was head of Aetna put a deal together with CVS, a merger, made $500 million in the merger. He does not like Medicare for All. I got it. But for the average American, the only difference you will see is a change in your card. It will say Medicare rather than United Health or Blue Cross. So what you just heard there was someone with an actual vision who has a very specific plan to stop medical bankruptcies, to stop deaths in this country due to either a lack of health insurance or due to someone who has insurance, but they need a particular procedure that would save their lives, but their health insurance company doesn't want to pay for it. That's someone with a vision. That's someone who is not just educating people about what to expect with his policy, but educating them about the propaganda that is being disseminated at the behest of health insurance companies. He's explaining that, look, these companies have a financial interest in existing, obviously. So they're going to tell you everything. They're going to fear monger and make it seem as if Medicare for all isn't in your best interest. But let me tell you why this is in your best interest. So Bernie Sanders is able to respond to all of these objections because when you have a clear vision, you're able to hold that vision up to scrutiny. But Joe Biden, he doesn't have time to talk about healthcare, not because he doesn't have enough time. I think that it's obvious 
when you're running a presidential campaign, all you have is time to talk about policy. But he just doesn't want to talk about policy because in order to talk about his vision, he'd essentially have to defend the status quo, which he wants to do, but that's indefensible. When you have a system in this country, even post-Obamacare, where individuals, thousands of which are dying every single year, are going bankrupt, that is indefensible. But contrast that with Bernie Sanders, and he can defend his vision because he has a vision that actually works and he's not doing it because he wants to appease the health insurance industry and his donors he's doing it because this is what he knows needs to happen in order to stop the healthcare crisis in this country so listen to the way that he responds to objections to medicare for all or some shortcomings potential shortcomings hypothetical shortcomings that it may have but there are some trade-offs aren't there i mean are people going to be able to see the doctor can you guarantee can you make that guarantee absolutely like obama and you'll be able to see your you'll, you'll be able to keep your doctor absolutely look the truth is right now you may have an insurance plan that the doctor you really like is not on that network mm -hmm. you cannot see the doctor you want on in many cases under the current plan under medicare for all freedom of choice with regard to any doctor, any hospital you want to go to. Well, what if everybody wants to see Dr. Sanders here in Des Moines? Uh, and there's more, more, more people. Well, than that's the same problem there, you have today. If you have a very popular. There's got to be trade-offs, though, right? But, I mean, but that's, look, if you have times. a really popular. Look, every other major country on earth, in one form or another, has a national health care plan. In every instance, they are far less expensive than is the case right now. So. If you have a popular doctor right now, under your current policy, it may take you a while to get in there. Uh, but under Medicare for All, freedom of choice with regard to doctors, with regard to hospitals, substantially lower prescription drug costs. We cannot defend, Jonathan. In fact, we cannot sustain a system in which the cost of health care continues to soar and we spend so much more than any other country. And by the way, our health care outcomes in terms of life expectancy, in terms of dealing with many diseases, it's not particularly good compared to many other countries. So what he's doing here is incredible. He is educating people. And this is something that no other politician is really doing. He's saying, look, all of these potential objections that you're bringing up, these are issues that exist currently. Oh, you want to see a specific doctor or you need to see a specialist? Well, if that individual is not in your network, too bad. You can't under our current system. Oh, there's a really popular doctor and everyone having coverage will make that individual more difficult to see. That's still kind of, kind of an issue. I mean, me personally, I have a doctor that I was recommended by someone in my family that I have not been able to see because this individual has been booked since forever. So what he's doing is he's explaining that all of these points that are being made against Medicare for all, they're nothing but propaganda. It's bullshit. So this rivalry, going back to the beginning of the video that was initially referenced last week by the Washington Post, this is just a microcosm of a bigger issue because this isn't just about a debate between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden when it comes to health care. This is a fight for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party. You have one individual that makes people feel good, that wouldn't really do anything to change their lives, but celebrities and elites love him. But then you have another individual who is new, someone who is introducing things that are unfamiliar to us, but would actually fundamentally change our lives and take the party in a new direction, get them off of this pro-corporate trajectory. But yet, it's all about personality in politics nowadays. It's all about the person who has the correct persona, who's the right character to take on Donald Trump. Well, guess what? This isn't just about who can defeat Donald Trump. This is about who can change the country because that's what matters most when it comes to politics. Because I hate to tell all of these centrists this, but if you feel uncomfortable with the president Donald Trump now, imagine the offering we'll get from Republicans after another four to eight years of neoliberalism. We'll get someone far worse than Donald Trump, a President Louis Gohmert or a President Ted Nugent. Because as you can see, the Republican Party is becoming more and more cartoonishly evil because they have answers for people who are desperate due to neoliberalism. What neoliberalism does is it breeds radicalization because it strips people of their dignity economic security and they end up opting for someone who's a demagogue who's going to tell them whatever who will say it's it's the immigrants who are making your life miserable 
and they will be susceptible to that message so long as we keep getting Democrats who aren't offering an alternative vision. What we all know, what's easy to see, if you're a normal American, the current traje trajectory that we're headed on is not even manageable. We have climate catastrophe. We have healthcare crisis in this country where every single year thousands of people die. And if we don't change course drastically, then things are going to get a lot worse. Americans know that. And they're willing to opt for anyone who is saying we're going to do things differently. Even if it's in the wrong direction, they just know that change is necessary and they may not necessarily be able to grasp the intricacies of what's going on and what's happening. But if Democrats don't understand that, if they don't grasp what they need to do, the country and the party long term will be worse off. So when it comes to this rivalry between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, there's no competition. But what's sad is that Joe Biden can be arrogant and say, bring it on, Bernie. I'll debate you on health care, even if he has no policy proposals, even if he cannot compete with Bernie, because he has the elites and the celebrities and the pundits to back him up. And it's sad. So obviously, if you truly want to be Donald Trump and more importantly, defeat fascism and white supremacy and Republican Party extremism, you've got to go for someone with a real vision. And there's one person in this race that truly not just has an alternative vision, but has a very specific plan as to how he's going to carry that out. It's Bernie Sanders. So if you'll recall, back in 2016, one of the main arguments that pundits and elites would use against Bernie Sanders was this argument about electability. Do you progressives care more about purity? Or do you actually want someone who can go up against the Republican and win, who's battle-tested? who's a pragmatist and knows how to get things done. In fact, let's look at this article from Barney Frank, who wrote that wishful thinking won't win the White House, meaning that, you know, if you're progressive, you shouldn't vote for Bernie Sanders because what you need to realize is that these are not practical positions for anyone to take. So if you want to win, you got to be more like Hillary Clinton. You've got to be more centrist. Well, as it turns out, they were wrong. The people who said that Hillary was more electable than Bernie Sanders, they were wrong because she lost. When you put up a boring, vacuous centrist against a Republican, what you do is you suppress turnout. Because if you really want to win, what you need to do is replicate Stacey Abrams' strategy and register new voters, bring out your base, get people involved who kind of checked out, who have been politically apathetic because you don't, like, the, the way that people visualize politics, really the elites, is there's this group of voters and winning is about winning over people in this group, but they don't think outside the box. They don't think that there are other people who don't vote who you need to go after, which is why they made this argument. Electability. Bernie can't win. Hillary can so what's the argument that they're using against Bernie Sanders now in 2020, seeing that he's running up against another boring, vacuous centrist? Take a guess. The same exact argument that they used in 2016. And I'll give you an example of that. So the CNN headline reads, Biden's run embodies the big question of Democratic primary. What's more important, policy or beating Trump? Now, this, kids, is what I like to call a false dichotomy. These are not things that are mutually exclusive. In fact, I'd argue that they're inextricably linked. Because if you want to win, you need to have a robust pol policy platform because people don't care about personal stories and nice anecdotes. They want someone who's going to tell them exactly how their policies will benefit their lives. But for whatever reason, this new consensus in D.C. has emerged where... Policy is almost a bad thing. The most policy substantive candidates are somehow a liability. In fact, Nate Silver literally claimed that the desire to focus exclusively on policy substance is actually somehow elitist because rank and file voters don't care much about policy. Imagine that. They're going so far out of their way to defend people like Joe Biden, who have zero policy substance. And they're now saying that those of us who care about policy are elitist. Well, isn't your assumption they're elitist? Isn't that actually pretty condescending to think that normal voters 
don't care, presumably because they're too dumb to care about policy. Not everyone is going to be a policy wonk, but people do care about policy. What they care about is how your policies will impact their lives. So to say that they don't care and it's elitist is absurd, but nonetheless, this is what we're seeing all at the behest of Joe Biden. Because he is policy-free, because he lacks substance, they have to do what they did back in 2016 for Hillary Clinton, now for Joe Biden, and defend the fact that he is vacuous. Rather than challenging Joe Biden to do better, rather, rather than making him actually put up policies, they're just saying, well, look, he's more electable because he's vacuous. Okay? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and we already tried that back in 2016, and it didn't work out, but nonetheless, keep saying that. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in this discussion about, you know, who has more policy and who doesn't, but the reason why I'm talking about it is because it relates to this broader theme of electability. And going back to 2016, what was another thing that they said about Bernie and why specifically we shouldn't vote for him, why he'd be a liability going up against the Republican? Well, the reason why... We were supposed to not vote for Bernie is because the fact that he is someone who self-identifies as a socialist is going to hurt him in a general. And the same things they said then are being echoed now. So in an ABC News interview, somebody asked him, you know, is that title of Democratic Socialist going to hurt you? Here's how he responded to that. Trump seems to want to run against you. And certainly he wants to run and Republicans want to run against socialism. Okay. Um, is, is it time for you to disavow that, that label? I mean, given that... Look, you know, the problem is, and on a television interview, it's hard for me to describe in depth what we mean by that. When Social Security was created, what did the Republicans call it? Called socialism. When Medicare was created, what did they call it? Again. Medicaid was created. Anytime you do things for the people and you stand up uh, to the uh, wealthy and powerful, you'll be labeled this, that, and the other thing. All but, of but, the but this issues, isn't label you embrace. Yeah, but all of the issues that we are talking about, raising the minimum wage to a living wage, uh, guaranteeing health care to all people, making public colleges and universities tuition free, these are ideas that in one form or another are in fact supported by the American people. So in, in talking about democratic socialism, yep. you've often pointed to countries like Denmark as, yes. as, as kind of the models. Uh, and, and, and you've acknowledged that Denmark taxes are a lot higher in Denmark. And, and in your words, you said, while it is difficult to become very rich in Denmark, no one is allowed to be poor. So is that your goal for America, where no one is allowed to be poor, but it's also difficult to become rich? Well, no, look, we're always going to have rich and poor. But it is insane and grotesque that three families own more wealth than the bottom half of America, that the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 92%. That 49% of all new income goes to the 1%. Look, we want companies to be profitable. That's good. But we don't want CEOs to make 300 times what their workers make. And I think you see that in many countries, including Scandinavia. You want a vibrant economy, but you want working people and the children. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. You got 20% of elderly people living on Social Security benefits of less than 13,000. This is the richest country in the history of the world. We can and must do better than that. The reason why I personally don't believe that that socialist label will hurt Bernie Sanders is because he's owning it. And whenever he owns it, whenever somebody asks him to clarify what he means by that, even though he's more of a social democrat, but he says, look, democratic socialism to me is implementing policies akin to social security, which is incredibly popular, taking a policy like Medicare and improving it and then expanding it. Th this is what I mean, really, when I say I'm a democratic socialist. But just, you know, at face value, just looking at this superficially, I think it makes sense for someone to assume that being a socialist will, uh, will hurt you in the general election because obviously Republicans will exploit that, they'll weaponize it, and they'll fearmonger nonstop, which is why someone like Joe Biden makes it very clear that he's not a socialist. In fact, this article states that he told Donald Trump, I'm no socialist, he's a capitalist, and thus it is logical for one to deduce that he is more electable. Except the problem with this line of thinking is that just saying you're not a socialist doesn't really do much because 
Republicans aren't willing to engage in a good faith discussion about the merits of socialism versus capitalism. This is nothing more than a tactic. Anything that they don't like, they attach that socialist label to. They did this to Obamacare from the very beginning and they still stand by that. In fact, a 2017 article by Conservative Review still referred to Obamacare after it's been implemented, after we know what to expect as socialism and claimed literally that it fulfills Marx's vision. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you try to convince them that you're not a socialist, they're still going to say, but you're a socialist. And after Joe Biden went out of his way to communicate to people and Trump and Republicans that he's no socialist, can you guess what the Republicans are calling him? A socialist. As Tal Axelrod of The Hill writes, Vice President Pence hammered former Vice President Joe Biden and other leading 2020 Democratic presidential contenders as advocating a socialist agenda. I think the choice that we face in the country today is a choice between freedom and socialism increasingly. President Trump has been advocating an agenda that's built on the principles of freedom in the marketplaces, lower taxes, less regulation, more access to energy, better fair trade deals, Pence told CNBC on Friday. But increasingly, whether it it be Joe Biden, whether it be Bernie Sanders, whether it be Elizabeth Warren and others in their party, they're advocating a socialist agenda of more government, higher taxes, and the same tired policies that created the malaise of the last administration where you saw less than 2% economic growth, Pence said. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I thought, we were told anyways, that Joe Biden is more electable and that Bernie Sanders is more of a liability because he claims he's a socialist. But yet Republicans are still calling Joe Biden a socialist after he said he's no socialist? <laughs> it's almost as if Republicans don't really give a damn and they're just going to use that word against you to galvanize voters. It doesn't matter. So you can call yourself a socialist. You can call yourself the Easter Bunny. Republicans will call you what they want to call you, what they think is going to help them win. And that's what this is about. So anyone who is trying to claim that that socialist label makes Bernie Sanders a liability, I think it actually makes him the better bet because at least he's owning it and he is always given the opportunity to explain what he means, whereas Republicans will just say Joe Biden's a socialist and then they think he's trying to hide it. I mean, it's obvious. The fact that Mike Pence would put Joe Biden in the same category as Bernie Sanders and even Elizabeth Warren is preposterous, but nonetheless, that's what they will do. That's what they have been doing, and they will do what they need to do to win. And that's what people really don't get. These pundits in D.C., they think that, you know, it's more strategic to position yourself as a centrist. It's more strategic to be a pragmatist and try to appeal to the median voter. And in their view, the median voter is just someone who is directly in the center of Republicans and Democrats. But the problem is that that's actually not mainstream because they're failing to realize that both parties are incredibly out of touch with average voters. More people are independent now than Republican or Democrat because the parties don't represent them. So anyone who uses socialism and this electability argument to bolster their claim that you should opt for someone like Joe Biden as opposed to Bernie Sanders, one, either they're incredibly misinformed, or two, they're trying to gaslight you. Because, first of all, to say we need a centrist to beat Trump is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. We literally just tried that. I mean, I say this all the time on the show, but I have to say that because they don't get it. They still say the same thing. We need a, we need a centrist. You know, if we elect someone who's far left, who's fringe like Bernie Sanders, we're going to lose. Except if your argument is that we need someone who is mainstream to be able to win against Trump, then they're undercutting their own argument because what they fail to see is that Bernie is mainstream. Bernie Sanders is opting for policies that are populist, meaning they are supported by most people. Federal jobs guarantee, Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage, tuition-free public colleges. These are all policies that are supported by most Americans, meaning they're mainstream. But yet people will say, you know what? He's still far left, he's not electable, and he's a liability. Maybe it's the case that they don't actually care about electability. Maybe they're just trying to lie to you because they know that Bernie Sanders is a threat to the status quo. Understand that a lot of the elites, the celebrities who push this electability narrative they're comfortable economically. And a lot of Democratic Party establishment figures 
I believe that they'd actually be more comfortable losing with Biden than winning with Bernie Sanders because Nancy Pelosi, for example, knows that if Democrats win, that means they'd actually have to do something, which means this would put their base up against their donors. And they don't want to do that. They don't want to offend their base and their donors. So they'd probably feel more comfortable just straight up losing. And a lot of elites probably feel more comfortable with Trump than Bernie Sanders, because even if Donald Trump is technically anti-establishment, there's still enough people in his ear that can control him. Whereas with Bernie Sanders, a lot of these special interests who bankroll both parties know that the gravy train will be over if Bernie Sanders gets elected. So if you see someone who is pushing this electability argument, understand this. They were wrong before, and we have absolutely no reason to trust their judgment again, especially if they're advocating for the same strategy that led to Donald Trump's victory in the first place. So if they're saying Bernie's not as electable as a centrist, they're either dumb or they're gaslighting you and you should be wary of this individual because they're not looking out for your best interests. They're looking out for their best interests. When a lot of people talk about or visualize the apocalypse or the end of the world, I believe they're thinking about it in terms of like that Hollywood perspective that's been embedded in our minds. You think about, you know, deep impact. You think about these movies where there's like an asteroid coming and it's one single event that will lead to mass extinction and there's hysteria, there's panic, and that's the way that people think about it. And it's scary to think about, you know, large portions of the population dying off or a lot of other species, non-human species going extinct. But what people fail to realize is that we're actually undergoing a mass extinction right now, currently. But the reason why we don't actually recognize that that's happening is because it's extremely subtle. It's not happening in the way that Hollywood presented it to us. It's happening in a much more insidious way. And a new report by the UN really quantifies how bad this is. And this report is chilling. It sent chills down the back of my spine because it's really been difficult to acknowledge the extent that humans have wreaked havoc on the planet, this report does that. Now, according to Isabel Gerritsen of CNN, she explains that 1 million of the planet's 8 million species are threatened with extinction by humans, scientists warn Monday, in what is described as the most comprehensive assessment of global nature loss ever. Their landmark report paints a bleak picture of a planet ravaged by an ever-growing human population whose insatiable consumption is destroying the natural world. The global rate of species extinction is already tens to hundreds of times higher than it has been on average over the last 10 million years, according to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a UN committee whose report was written by 100 145 experts from 50 countries. So let's just pause for a moment and try to take in these numbers because whenever we start hearing these types of numbers, you know, that's extremely difficult to visualize because humans are a lot more capable of grasping small scale events. But let's just think about this. 145 experts from 50 countries are telling us this. So the implication is obviously this is not political. Nobody's motivated here. This is science. And the rate of species extinction, I mean, species are pretty much always going extinct, but the rate that it's happening now is tens to hundreds times higher than it has been on average over the last 10 million years. It is difficult to conceptualize what that looks like. But let's just say the uh, white rhino. That's a species that, you know, extinction is happening, but it's happening twice as fast. If we say it's happening twice as fast, we can kind of grasp that it's happening really, really fast. But if we say it's happening tens to hundreds of times faster, that's such an unfathomable rate that it makes it easy for people to almost just tune out because that's so difficult to grasp. But really what we can take away from this 
in order to, you know, get this more concrete visual of what's happening is that species are dying really, really fast. And we're the cause. We're the cause. Now, for some additional details, more specifics, we go to Jake Johnson of Common Dreams, who explains, according to the report, the average abundance of native species in most major land-based habitats has fallen by at least 20%, mostly since 1900. More than 40% of amphibian species, almost 33% of reef-forming corals, and more than a third of all marine mammals are threatened. The picture is less clear for insect species, but available evidence supports a tentative estimate of 10% being threatened. At least 680 vertebrae species had been driven to extinction since 16th century, and more than 9% of all domesticated breeds of mammals used for food and agriculture had become extinct by 2016, with at least 1,000 more breeds still threatened. It's devastating. And a lot of people may think about this in terms of, wow, well, this means I can no longer appreciate the beauty or the cuteness of, we'll say, a polar bear. They'll no longer be around for me to admire, for me to watch in these nature shows, but it's a lot more complex than that. The way that nature works and the ecosystem works is that, you know, these species don't exist in a vacuum. One species going extinct impacts the food chain. It impacts the environment and other species. And ultimately, that trickles up to us and impacts us directly. So even if you can kind of put that out of your head and think, well, this is about, you know, these animals and these amphibians, understand that this has implications deleterious consequences for human beings as well. Now, there are five main drivers, and as the IPBES points out, these drivers include changes in land and sea use, overfishing, overconsumption, direct exploitation of organisms, climate change, pollution, invasive species, and these are all things that are interlinked. So by tackling one, you can affect other ones indirectly. So for example, if you tackle pollution, that's obviously going to be a net benefit for climate change. But this is really difficult. We're overconsuming, we're overfishing, we're overpolluting. And in short, we're having a devastating impact on life on the planet. And in turn, we're undermining our own survivability. We're undermining the overall habitability of our planet, and it's chilling. This is one of those um, articles where I feel like I'm not a very good political commentator. I don't know what to say. I don't have any answer. There's no solution. I don't know. This is a wicked problem to where even if you got the brightest minds in the world together and they came up with the exact outline as to what we need to do to stop the hemorrhaging, then there's this question of political will. What do we do to get governments, plural governments, to come together and face this crisis, this planet-wide crisis? And are they willing to do that? I can't do anything. I can't add to this conversation. I can encourage you as an individual to take action and do things to mitigate, you know, this issue, I can say, reduce your carbon footprint, go vegan. But even if we all individually do what we can, the fact remains that this is an issue that needs to be addressed by governments. Human beings in and of themselves are not capable of addressing this on an individual level. We have to address this at the government level. And where to even start is another question. This is not one of those issues where it's going to happen, like climate change. Like, we already know that climate change is happening, but it's something that we can still kind of try to mitigate or at least stop the worst of what climate change has to offer. But what this report tells us is that it's not like there's this mass extinction event that's coming. It's happening right now. We are in the midst of a mass extinction event. We may not be able to feel it, we can go on with our lives and watch Netflix and complain about Game of Thrones Season 8, which we all should, by the way. But with that being said, 
what's happening is devastating. I'm thinking about this in terms of like a couple generations from now. My great niece who was born a couple of months ago, what her grandchildren will have to deal with. Because we, our generation, millennials and Gen Z, we know that the apocalypse is coming. But it's just a couple of generations forward who will have to live through this. And maybe it's the case that the planet survives. Human beings make it out of this. That we don't become the victims of this current extinction event. But either way, things will have to change. We're not going to be able to consume at the rate that we're consuming because we live on a planet with finite resources. We're not going to be able to pollute and destroy the planet because of corporate profits. Things have to change if we're going to survive. The problem is that humans don't necessarily, or probably, this is speculative, won't have the will to take action until it's too late. But I don't know. I mean... All that I can do as a political commentator is give you this information and allow you to do with it as you will. But as long as we're knowledgeable and we know about what's happening, that's just the first step. You can't solve a problem unless you know what's happening. But understand, this is chilling. And it's really um, pretty crazy to think that we're, we're living through a mass extinction. This hasn't been the best week for people who are non-interventionist or anti-war activists like myself because there's been a number of really troubling developments and I think we all know that the first is that North Korea tested a missile. Now, I don't necessarily think that this poses a threat to us. However, we already know what's going to happen. The media is going to try to go Trump into being more hawkish and people within the administration, John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, will probably try to escalate. Now, with that being said, I actually have to give Donald Trump credit because his instinct here is actually correct. Him trying to pursue peace and seeking out a diplomatic solution, even if we all know that he's in over his head, even if we all know that... He doesn't really have the slightest idea as to how to actually achieve something comparable to the Iran deal with North Korea. The fact that he's trying is important. I'd rather him try even if it's a failed effort because I think that that's preferable to him threatening to bomb them on Twitter again. Now, as we all could have predicted, the media is trying to portray Trump as weak since he's technically allowing this to happen and since he's not really doing anything about it. And of course, this is all just them pushing him to be more hawkish with regard to North Korea when thus far, at least for the better part of the last year and a half or so, he's been pursuing the correct ideal. I don't want to say strategy because I don't think he really thinks strategically, but nonetheless, in not trying to provoke them, that's good. But the media is trying to change that. Now, on top of the North Korea situation, the United States inexplicably sent aircraft carriers and bombers to the Middle East after Israel reportedly warned U.S. intelligence about a, quote, credible threat that is posed from Iran, which gave John Bolton the opportunity to threaten them yet again, saying that they'll be met with, quote, unquote, unrelenting force if they attack us or one of our allies. And the United States is responding in the way that we'd expect them to respond because you have a bunch of neocons in Trump's administration, such as John Bolton, who wanted to see Tehran, quote, liberated as early as 2019. So these are people who are psychopaths in Donald Trump's ear trying to influence him to be more hawkish towards Iran. And now all of a sudden, they're taking a very escalatory approach in taking our aircraft carriers and bombers and putting them in the Middle East, which essentially is them sending a message to Iran. They're trying to intimidate Iran. Now, what's the best method here in the event they really are planning something, which they're not? Israel has said this many times, but let's say hypothetically speaking, Iran does want to do something. They want to attack U.S. forces in Syria. What do we do? We talk to them. That's what you do. Rather than resorting to war, rather than trying to look for reasons to overthrow their regime for a second time, because we did this before, maybe try diplomacy. But see, Donald Trump wants to try that with North Korea, but when it comes to Iran, which is the real goal for neocons in his administration, he's just kind of letting them do what they want. 
Now, another area which is incredibly troubling with regard to foreign policy and international issues is the situation in Venezuela. Because as we all know, the U.S. is salivating over their oil reserves. John Bolton said on Fox Business, on national television, that wouldn't it be great if we got in there and we were able to have U.S. oil companies take control of their oil reserves? Wouldn't that be amazing? They're saying the things that they're supposed to keep to themselves, but they're saying it out in the open. So for months now, we've been trying to overthrow Maduro and install our preferred puppet, Juan Guaido, who is going to play ball with us. Now, what Guaido just did was he called for people to take to the streets in order to really show that he is a force to be reckoned with and Maduro needs to step down. And really, this was a message to the military. Hey, I've got all of these people on my side. I've got the U.S. government on my side. So if you're going to choose sides, make sure you pick the winning horse. Turns out that failed. So what is Trump's administration doing? Well, Mike Pence is now trying to convince the military with both a stick and carrot approach to abandon Maduro. Now, I'm going to play this short Reuters clip for you that kind of gives you a brief rundown of the situation. In a speech on Tuesday, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence will try to persuade Venezuela's military to turn on their leader. That's according to a senior administration official who told Reuters that Pence's address at the State Department will offer incentives for soldiers to switch sides and warnings to Venezuelan magistrates who don't. People of Venezuela are seeking to reclaim freedom and democracy in their nation a nation impoverished by dictatorship, socialism, and oppression. The U.S. supported opposition leader Juan Guaido's call last week to overthrow socialist president Nicolas Maduro. But the White House watched in frustration as anti-government protests petered out and Maduro appeared firmly in control of the armed forces. The, the president's made clear that no option is off the table. We the U.S. administration repeatedly said it was considering different ways to achieve a peaceful transition of power, but offered few specifics. Well, guess what? Now they're starting to get into the specifics because as Matt Laszlo of Vice News explains, with Venezuela still in turmoil after last week's failed military coup headed by opposition leader Juan Guaido, the Trump administration is scrambling to find a way to dislodge President Nicolas Maduro. Some are talking openly about using the U.S. military to assist Guaido and his ragtag opposition, and that has lawmakers in both parties worried. On Sunday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the administration is preparing for the option of using American armed forces for more than merely supporting the drive to bring humanitarian aid to the hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans on the brink of starvation. Now, please understand that when we talk about humanitarian aid, when we talk about the suffering in Venezuela because of Maduro, media and the U.S. government doesn't actually care about suffering and impoverished Venezuelans. They're politicizing their suffering. They're also not giving you the full context. They're not telling you that we're actually responsible for a large part of the instability in Venezuela currently. Because back in 2014, 2015, I think it was, the United States government teamed up with Saudi Arabia and Israel to artificially drive down the price of oil, which undercut Venezuela, which cut off their revenue stream. Now, in part, it's idiotic that Venezuela didn't try to diversify their economy. It was largely propped up on oil. But nonetheless, since they didn't, since they were forced to compete with an international market, they had to lower the cost of oil. And of course, that led to less revenue for their government, which led to political instability as the economy suffered because of that. And then when there were mass protests because of the political instability that we caused, well, then what did we do? We imposed sanctions to punish the Venezuelan government for the way that they responded to the instability that we caused. So we're part of the problem, but yet we're saying, oh, we care about these suffering Venezuelans and we just want to get aid to them. It's all a trick. And I would love to say don't fall for it, but a lot of people have already fallen for it. So think about some of the broad themes here that we often see when talking about, you know, Venezuela, when talking about Iran, 
we hear about this concept of liberation and freedom and democracy and we're also talking about taking preemptive action in order to address what is a credible threat to us that's what we're saying when it comes to iran now i want to play a clip from 2003 it's a compilation of bush administration officials talking about why we need to invade iraq and this was before the iraq war it was the lead up to it and try to see if you notice any similarities in terms of the broad themes that they used then and if it's similar to what we're seeing now when it comes to venezuela and iran and the rhetoric with which we discuss these countries. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. The read we get on the people of Iraq is there's no question but what they want to get rid of Saddam Hussein and they will welcome as liberators the United States when we come to do that. The White House hopes to call for a vote on the deadline resolution early next week. If it passes, then by March 17th as a senior official, Saddam Hussein will finally be out of final opportunities. But even if it doesn't pass, the president has left no doubt he's ready to go to war sound familiar we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud so we need to invade iraq because they pose a threat to us well all of a sudden we're deploying aircraft carriers to the middle east because iran poses a threat to us according to israel the people of iraq want to get rid of saddam hussein what do they tell us about Venezuela? The people of Venezuela are taking to the streets. They're, they're, they're marching. They want to get rid of Maduro. They want us to intervene. So do you understand? All of the same themes are always reused each time we want to invade another country. And right now we're in that process where they're trying to build a case and legitimize this war effort. That's what we're seeing in Venezuela, where now they're openly talking about a military option since the carrot approach hasn't worked. So now we're moving on to the stick approach. And we're seeing this also with Iran, where we are intimidating them. So understand what Donald Trump's administration is doing. This is nothing new. It's what we saw back in 2003. So I would like to tell you, don't buy this. I'd like to say that the U.S. media is going to be educating people, but essentially they're doing the bidding of these warmongers who want to invade these other countries. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that Donald Trump's administration will invade Iran or will invade Venezuela or take military action in either of these two countries, but do they want to? Yes, if they feel as if they have legitimacy from the american people and if they can do it without taking too much backlash would they do it unquestionably so the whole point of this video is for me to tell you watch what they're doing because what we're seeing now is exactly what we saw in the lead up to the iraq war and we know how that played out we know how libya played out we know how all of these regime change wars turned out not great to say the least so don't let them do it again. It's incumbent on us to stop them before another regime change war gets started. I think it's safe to say that Rachel Maddow is officially the left-wing equivalent of Sean Hannity. She's also the MSNBC equivalent of H.A. Goodman because she really found this one issue that drove ratings, it got her views and clicks online, and it made her incredibly popular. It essentially made her period. And because she found this one issue, she chose to stick to it because monetarily speaking, it behooved her to do just that. Now, I don't have to tell you guys what that issue is. We all know which issue I'm talking about. Russia, Russia, Russia hates Russia, 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 Putin, Russia's Russia, 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 Russian, 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 Russia, Russia, Moscow, Moscow, Russia, Russian, pro Russian, Russian, Russia, Russian, 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 the Russians, Russian, 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 Russia, Russian, 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 Moscow, Russian, Russian, Russia, Putin, Russian, 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 Russian against us, Russians, Russians, Russia against the US, the Russians, Russia, 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 Russian, Russian government scheme, the Russians, Vladimir Putin, Russia, Vladimir Putin, Russia, Putin, Putin and Russia, Russia, Moscow, Russia, Russian, Russian, Russia, the Russians, 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 Russia, Russia, Russian, Russian, Russia, Russia, Putin, Putin, Putin.
Putin, Putin, Putin. Russian, 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 Russia. The Soviet Empire. The second of the 20th century's great evils. Communism. Hey, Russia. Communism. Russia. Assault by Russia. 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 Russia's been Russia. Russia. Putin despises the West in general and the United States in particular. The Soviet Empire. Russia. 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 They're the adversary. They, they want to bring us down the Soviet Union. Okay, that was, uh, that's all for that show. That was one, that was from one show. Yeah. <laughs> so it's safe to say that she talked about Russia nonstop for two years because that's what helped her tremendously. It gave her a huge ratings boost. She actually became number one at numerous points over the course of the last two years because a lot of people looked to her as the person who would give them coverage of this Russia story that they were so captivated by. However, after Mueller's investigation concluded and the report was put out and confirmed that this collusion theory was bogus, which essentially was the driver of the mystery, this treason hypothesis, well, what happened? Obviously, it was the case that MSNBC and Rachel Maddow's ratings specifically tanked because, I mean, you're watching, you're tuning in every single night for two years and the thing she told you that was going to happen didn't happen. So obviously that's a disappointment. And in cable news, ratings is everything. If you don't have good ratings, that can threaten you existentially. So Rachel Maddow, she knew that she had to make a choice after the Mueller report came out. Am I going to pivot now and actually do my job as a journalist and educate my viewers about the issues that they need to hear about? Or am I going to try to milk this Russia Gate story a little bit longer in order to see if I can still salvage this story, get a little bit more views and clicks? She chose the latter. And now what's happening is this Russia story has graduated. It's no longer just about Russia and how they're controlling Donald Trump. Now it's about Russia bad and the United States needs to always take an adversarial stance against Russia no matter what. So here's what she said recently about Russia. And what you're going to see here is she's going to take this issue, the story that she's been covering, and she's now going to weaponize it to attack Trump, but simultaneously as she's attacking him, she's trying to goad him into intervention in Venezuela. Literally, this is an MSNBC host, a supposed left winger, who's going to side with John Bolton here. I mean, how do you come to work anymore if you were John Bolton? Right, regardless of what you thought about John Bolton before this, of his whole career and his track record, I mean, instead of a just think of John Bolton as a human being. This is what John Bolton, human being, thought his job was this week. Like, again, whether, or not, whether you like what he's saying here or not, this is what they've had him out there saying. The Trump administration has also made the claim that Russia is very much involved in propping up the Maduro regime. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told my colleague Wolf Blitzer yesterday that there was a plane waiting to take Maduro to Cuba, but the Russians talked him out of it. What exactly is the Russian role here? Look, the Russians uh, like nothing better than putting a thumb in our eye. They're using the Cubans as surrogates. Uh, they'd love to get effective control of a country in this hemisphere. We've made it clear to the Russians in a lot of conversations at a lot of different levels, uh, some of which are going to continue today, why we think this behavior is unacceptable to us. Yeah, you thought that was your job, but it turns out uh, not at all. Not after Vladimir Putin gets done with President Trump today. He is uh, not looking at all to get involved in Venezuela, other than he'd like to see something positive happen for Venezuela. Putin doing anything in Venezuela? <laughs> Who said Putin's doing anything bad in Venezuela? Who have you been listening to? I'm with him. He says he's not. I mean, John Bolton, God bless you. Good luck delicately and carefully shaving around that impressive mustache when you have to look at yourself in the mirror in coming days, Mr. National Security Advisor. I mean, this is who you're working for. You thought your job was to push Russia back because of what they're doing in Venezuela. The president spent an hour on the phone with Vladimir Putin today. Putin told him he's not in Venezuela. So now the new position of the U.S. government is that Putin's not in Venezuela. She officially belongs on Fox News. Because it was always a sure bet that if you tuned in to Fox News, they would always take 
the pro-war stance because they have defense contractors that advertise on their stations. And of course, you'd expect MSNBC and CNN to do this, but never to the extent that Fox News does it. Never explicitly in the way that Fox News does it. But here she is, siding with John Bolton. Now, if she wants to agree with John Bolton about the extent to which Russia is influencing the situation in Venezuela, fine. But the underlying implication in that segment was that this is bad, and as a result, because this is bad, then subsequently, what should logically follow? We take action to stop that influence in Venezuela, to stop Vladimir Putin from meddling in Venezuela. If she were a real journalist, she would be asking why we're in Venezuela and why we're allowed to meddle in Venezuela, but Russia isn't. Why is it just assumed that us being in Venezuela is inherently good and Russia being in Venezuela is inherently bad? Maybe all countries should leave Venezuela alone. Maybe all countries should stop meddling. But over the course of the last couple of years, she was screeching about how Russia meddled in our election, and here she is explicitly advocating for us to meddle with Venezuela's affairs. This is about the oil. Now, Rachel Maddow should be telling people about this. She's smart enough to know what's really happening here. But what is she choosing to do? She's making the choice to not tell people the truth and instead to focus on the aspect of this story that will get her the most ratings. If you can spin this and make it about Russia and not about the U.S. empire intervening in another Latin American country, well, that's better for ratings than just telling people the truth. So this is what a sellout looks like, ladies and gentlemen. Rachel Maddow has sold her soul for ratings and views, and she knows that she brought people along on this ride, this Russian ride, and she is determined to convince you that Russia is the greatest threat to international peace and security. And if we don't fight them at every step of the way, fight them at every turn, be overtly adversarial, then that's inherently evil. And yet, conservatives have the nerve to say that there's this liberal bias. Someone who's advocating for war on MSNBC, I wouldn't call them liberal. I would call that individual a conservative tool of the military-industrial complex who is doing exactly what they want her to do. Add to this case that Trump has currently tried to build that legitimizes their potential military efforts in Venezuela, if it comes to that. Shame on Rachel Maddow. And what's devastating is that I know a lot of lefties in person who still absolutely adore and respect Rachel Maddow and they take whatever she says as gospel. And this is what she's doing. Because she has that legitimacy, this makes her particularly even more dangerous, I'd argue, than Sean Hannity. Because I think a lot of people can look at Sean Hannity and dismiss him because this guy is clearly cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But Rachel Maddow is seemingly intelligent. She's articulate. She knows what she's talking about, presumably. So for her to do this, that makes her uniquely dangerous because the people who have legitimacy and parrot this type of propaganda, this pro-war propaganda, they're especially dangerous. If you don't remember who Brian Kemp is, allow me to refresh your memory. Brian Kemp is Georgia's current governor who stole the election from Stacey Abrams. As Secretary of State in Georgia, he used his authority to put up barriers that stopped people who wanted to vote, who would have likely voted for Stacey Abrams, from voting. And essentially what he did was try to get people to not vote because he knew that with this race being so close, the more people that voted, the less likely he would be to win. But he cheated, he won, and now he's the governor, and he's back in the news because he just recently signed a very controversial heartbeat bill into law, which is the most draconian ban on abortion yet. 
Now, as the Washington Post reports, Republican Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia signed a controversial heartbeat bill into law on Tuesday, outlawing most abortions once a doctor detects what some call a fetal heartbeat in the womb, usually about six weeks into a pregnancy. Kemp said he is upholding his promise to enact the toughest abortion law in the country. Now, what's the most obvious thing about this bill? It is brazenly unconstitutional. Because the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade, in a 7-2 to two decision, ruled that states cannot regulate pregnancies within the first trimester. Women have full autonomy over their bodies within that first trimester. And this was affirmed in 1992 in KCV Planned Parenthood. So he's going out of his way to regulate pregnancies in the first trimester trimester knowing that this is unconstitutional ask yourself why he's doing this well if you'll recall last year brett kavanaugh was confirmed to the supreme court giving conservatives a strong five justice majority so basically what he's doing here is he's passing this law that he knows is unconstitutional and he's basically challenging people to sue him you don't like this law? Sue me. Because what happens? They can appeal all the way up to the Supreme Court, and now with that strong five-justice majority, they can overturn Casey. They can overturn Roe v. Wade here. So he knows that this law is illegal. But this isn't about the legality of this particular law. This is about getting abortion overturned, getting Roe v. Wade more specifically overturned in all 50 states. So that way, in the event states want to impose their own abortion laws like the heartbeat bill, they will now be able to constitutionally do that if he gets his way. So understand that this is what that's all about. This isn't about him signing this bill into law and fulfilling a campaign promise. He knows that he wants to catalyze a challenge to Roe v. Wade. He wants the challenge of the cases that upheld abortion. And what's sad is that this may actually be a successful strategy. This could ultimately be conducive to nationwide overturning of abortion laws. Now, let's just take a moment to picture what that would look like in practice if that actually happened. Let's say in 2021, the Supreme Court strikes down Roe v. Wade. They reverse course move away from that precedent, and states now have the autonomy to regulate the first trimester of pregnancies however they want to, how many states do you think would just outright ban abortion? Within the first year, even. At a minimum, a dozen, but probably more. So understand what they're doing here. This is strategy. He knows that this can't stand but he wants it to be challenged because he knows that this ultimately will have a net benefit effect in the event he gets his way. It's tricky, but certainly it's disgusting. Because the reason why we allow women to have full autonomy over their bodies and the reason why the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade ruled that states can't regulate pregnancies that early is because the fetus is still developing. It can't feel pain yet. And for you to tell a woman what she can or can't do with her own body is the biggest overreach of government ever. But these small government conservatives don't care about hypocrisy because their hypocrisy is a feature of modern day conservatism. They don't care. It's just about getting their agenda implemented and they'll do it by whatever means necessary. So it's tricky, but... Um, or strategic is what I was trying to say, but um, it's dirty. It's absolutely dirty. So I took my mother to see Deep Throat. And... <laughs> so if you'll all recall, John Hickenlooper is the 2020 presidential candidate who thoroughly embarrassed himself at a CNN town hall when he admitted that he watched porn with his mom. For three minutes, he explained how he took his mother to see Deep Throat. So at that point, I think pretty much his campaign was over. You're done. You're a weirdo. Like, 
how do you not dodge that question? How do you not swap that away and say, look, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the real issues. But he answered it. He took the bait and he went on to explain in great detail at great length how this happened. So the dude is an imbecile <laughs> and a weirdo. I mean, if, you, if you're watching porn with your mom, I'm sorry, but you're weird. But now he's back in the news and to nobody's surprise, he is embarrassing himself again. Why? Because he's comparing Bernie Sanders' policies to Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Not kidding. So as Travis Moran of New Hampshire Union Leader reports, while former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper speaks often about his disdain for negative attacks on his opponents, the Rocky Mountain governor turned Democratic presidential candidate laid out an economic platform on Friday that seemed to take direct aim at fellow 2020 contender Senator Bernie Sanders for his Democratic Socialist agenda. While Sanders was not name-checked in the prepared remarks Hickenlooper delivered while announcing a six-point economic development plan at St. Anselm College, the two-term governor launched multiple attacks on socialism, branding the idea, quote, no better today than it was 100 years ago, and invoking the dictatorship of the Soviet Union. You have to hand it to the GOP for achieving the near impossible, said Hickenlooper. Just years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, their greedy mismanagement has revived the lure of socialism for a whole generation of Americans. Who would have imagined the Koch brothers and Donald Trump could help resuscitate the discredited ideas of Karl Marx and Joseph Stalin. The apparent references to Sanders didn't stop there, with Hickenlooper going on to criticize elected officials in Washington who would demonize the private sector to score political points and branding universal health care and guaranteed jobs to policies supported by Sanders as hazardous to the American people. These are certainly big ideas. They are also not good ideas, said Hickenlooper. They would bloat the federal government, they would massively raise taxes, they would depress economic growth, and let me assure you, in the end, they would hurt working people. So if I'm understanding him correctly, the idea here is that Republicans are so repugnant that, you know, people are now opting for Marxism and Stalinism. They've been so turned off by conservatism and deep throat capitalism that they're going to the opposite end of the spectrum. That's essentially what I think he's trying to communicate here. But if you think that Bernie Sanders is a Marxist or a Stalinist, you're just stupid. Like, I don't want to be condescending to John Hickenlooper here, but this is a really stupid thing to say. Bernie Sanders isn't even a democratic socialist, and I really wish that he wouldn't call himself that. He's more of a social democrat. So what he's advocating for is to replicate some of the policies and the good ideas that we see in Scandinavia. Take what other countries do right, like Australia or Canada when it comes to healthcare, and emulate their success here. That's all he's advocating for. But you're saying that what Bernie wants is on par to what we saw with the Soviet Union? What an idiotic thing to say. This guy is a former governor, and he's saying that social democracy is akin to Stalinism. John, suspend your campaign. I mean, you already made a fool of yourself when you explained how you watched porn with your mom, but this is next level stupid. Uh... Uh, uh, a, uh, uh. Now, he's kind of trying to give himself plausible deniability since he didn't name drop Bernie Sanders. And he's saying, look, I'm not talking about Bernie Sanders. I respect Senator Sanders. I respect his followers and their enthusiasm. But we know what you were doing. You were trying to prime people to think about Bernie's policies as Marxism and Stalinism when that is absolutely not the case. And it's a really dumb point to make. Now, state representative from Colorado and Bernie Sanders supporter, Emily Sirota, tweeted out this about his statement. It is disheartening to see Colorado's former Democratic governor, John Hickenlooper, liken the push for policies like Medicare for All, tuition-free college, and the Green New Deal to the policies of Joseph Stalin. This is unacceptable and embarrassing for our state. Yeah, if somebody from Oregon said this, like if Kate Brown, governor of Oregon, compared Bernie's policies to Stalin, I would be embarrassed because that's such a stupid thing. It's so far removed from the truth that you can't really respond. Like you can't dignify that with 
you know, a thorough, nuanced comeback. You just have to stop and laugh at that person because they're clearly misinformed. And really with John John Hickenlooper, I don't think that he is that dumb. I think he just knows what the truth is because, again, he's a former governor and he's just trying to prime people. This is a strategic way of getting people to think about Deep throat. Bernie Sanders and associate him with Stalinism. And it's, you know, it's a tactic. But it's a dumb one, and he's just making himself look foolish because what you're doing is you're using a GOP line of attack on Bernie Sanders. You're essentially doing the Democratic Party equivalent of Venezuela. And you're not making Bernie look worse, John. You're making yourself look like a huge fucking dumbass because, wow, what a stupid thing to say. So lately, I think it's evident to all of us that Bernie Sanders has not been quiet about just how bad Joe Biden's record is. And lately, he's been politely talking about how his record, just objectively speaking, from the standpoint of someone who's progressive, is leagues ahead of Joe Biden's record. He talks about how he was against the Iraq war, whereas Joe Biden voted for it. The same is true for NAFTA. The same is true for the repeal of Glass-Steagall, the, the bankruptcy bill, permanent normal trade relations with, with China. So what Bernie Sanders is doing here is what you should be doing in a primary. Now is the time to duke it out. Now is the time to present your platform and your record to the American people and allow them to decide Who's the best? Who's the strongest? If you're not doing this, then you're not in it to win it. But Bernie Sanders has been vocal about this and he's carrying on, you know, in, a, in I think the nicest way possible. Because if I were in Bernie's shoes, I would be a lot more negative than he's being. But I think that he probably has the better strategy here in trying to keep it civil. But nonetheless, Donna Brazil, a Fox News contributor now, was asked about Bernie's strategy here. And she had some things to say about it that I took issue with. So... Take a look at what she had to say. Joe voted for the war uh, in Iraq. I led the effort against it. Joe voted for NAFTA and permanent normal trade relations, trade agreements with China. I helped led the effort against that. I think if you look at Joe's record and you look at my record, I don't think there's much question about who's more progressive. You might be able to start getting used to this. Senator Bernie Sanders taking a shot at Joe Biden. Meanwhile, Real Clear Politics average a poll shows Biden nearly 24 points ahead of Sanders and everybody else. Wow. Donna Brazil, former interim chair for the DNC, Fox News contributor. How you doing? Good morning to you. Oh, good morning. So they're starting to fire inside the tent. How do you <laughs> feel about that? Oh, it's going to backfire. Uh, people know Joe Biden. Joe Biden can walk into a union hall. He can go to a corner grocery store and go to church in a black church. Joe Biden is one of those uh, candidates that people know. They, they respect him. They know his record of leadership. And while there are many progressives in the race, Joe Biden is someone that has not just good, uh, good values, but he's somebody who can speak to progressives as well as moderates and conservatives. Oh, so you, are, party. You saying that, are you saying Bernie Sanders should back off then? I'm saying it didn't work in 2016 with what an establishment candidate called Hillary Clinton. She, she received four million more votes. I'm just saying that perhaps the best way to win, if you're not Joe Biden, is to go out there and to talk about your record of leadership, talk about the things that you hope to do to help the American people, but to attack Joe Biden simply for being Joe Biden, that's but not that, going to This work. is politics. I mean, you know, I mean, you, of course it's politics. you know the way that works. A Democratic he's a, strategist he's a quoted runner. in The Hill. Here we go. I think people's initial reaction. The concern is that he's out of step with the primary electorate. And, oh, well, uh, I, I well, don't sorry, know that. What were you shooing away there? Was that a Louisiana well, they, I don't fly? Know, I, what was that? I don't know. That was not a Louisiana fly because they don't fly that high. Um, <laughs> they're gut level flies. This was like a big bee that just came after me. So I don't, you know me, I, I don't like things to fly I thought in my you were face. shooing me away, okay? Honey, R no, not you. Not you, Shuga. Ronna McDaniel was with us two hours ago, right? You ready for this? Uh -huh. Roll it. Give okay. this a listen. Here she is. Head of the RNC. I think he's a temporary uh, front runner. He's gotten a bounce because of name ID, because he just launched his campaign. Obviously, he's well known around the country. He has not faced any tough questions, and he certainly hasn't hit that debate stage with those other 20 candidates. How about that? Well, let me just Tis say early. this. I, I, I've been around the block a time or two, and let me tell you something. Joe Biden has also been around the track a time or two. Uh, all I'm saying, Bill, is that Joe Biden is a strong candidate, but he, this is not a cakewalk. He's going to face a lot of competition. And you have some people like Kamala Harris and 
of course, Elizabeth Warren and others that believe that the party should go in a different direction. So I'm looking forward to the debates as well. So the overall point that she was trying to make is that if Bernie's plan here is to criticize Joe Biden's record, it will ultimately backfire. She said, quote, to attack Joe Biden simply for being Joe Biden, that's not going to work. But that doesn't really make sense, Donna, because he's not attacking Joe Biden based on personal characteristics. He's not attacking Joe Biden for being Joe Biden. He's saying, look at Joe Biden's record. His record is terrible. He voted for the Iraq war. There are hundreds of thousands of deaths on his hands, on his conscience, because he lacked the foresight to see that Bush was lying us into a war. He was in support of the crime bill. He wrote it and he championed it, and he didn't acknowledge how this would lead to mass incarceration. But the reason why Donna Brazil can't comprehend why this is a good strategy for Bernie is because she genuinely doesn't believe that Joe Biden is as bad as we're telling her he is. She said that, Joe Biden is someone who can speak to progressives as well as moderates and conservatives. Factually incorrect. He is the antithesis of what progressives are looking for in a Democratic Party politician. He is essentially a conservative, and I think that what she doesn't realize is that progressives like myself, we don't view Joe Biden as just, you know, another friend, someone who we don't necessarily agree with all the time, but for the most part, at the end of the day, we have the same mission. No. That's not our perception. That's your perception. Joe Biden is the enemy. The Democratic Party establishment, they are our enemy. Just because we're forced to share a party with them because the opposition is insane doesn't mean that we have to like them. They are our enemy. And we are to oppose corporate Democrats and centrists and neoliberals as much as we oppose Republicans. Because they're not looking out for us. They don't have the same goals that we have. Joe Biden is against Medicare for all. Health insurance companies are betting on him to save the country, quote unquote, save the country from Medicare for all. Whereas Bernie Sanders has them shitting their pants. Bernie Sanders has providers of Medicare Advantage plans increasing benefits to kind of communicate to Bernie, please don't kill us. We can provide some value here. We don't just care about profits. So do you understand here? She doesn't get that they are not our friends, they're not our allies, they're our enemies. And sharing a party for purposes of defeating Republicans does not mean that every time, you know, we are doing this debate about who has the best record at the end of the day, we're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. If Joe Biden wins and becomes the Democratic Party's nominee, that's a lose for progressives. Now, is he preferable to someone like Donald Trump? Absolutely. Was Hillary Clinton preferable to someone like Donald Trump? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't suggest that if they win, progressives win. Because their ideology is at odds with our ideology. And that's what she fails to understand. Now, one thing I want to talk about here. Um, so the Fox host, he said the concern is that Joe Biden is out of step with the primary electorate. And I'm actually surprised that a Fox News host brought that up. But at first, I was a little bit irritated with Donna Brazil because it looked like she condescendingly like swatted away that notion, like she kind of flicked her wrist. And I'm like, really, you're going to be that arrogant and dismiss that notion that we have legitimate criticisms. But I went back and I watched it and she literally was swatting away a fly, like a big ass fly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you look at this from a, a perspective of strategy, if you are behind in the polls, which Bernie Sanders is, one of the key strategies that you should be suggesting is to play offense. Make the person ahead of you play defense and attack them. You don't have to be vindictive. You don't have to resort, resort to ad hominem attacks, but attack them and Show people why they're garbage. Show people why they're not the best candidate and why you are. Now, you do have to navigate carefully, and I think that Bernie Sanders is cognizant of this fact because political science research does show that oftentimes when you play offense, this can also affect your perception. So if people view you as someone who's being too negative, 
this can hurt you. But I think that what Bernie Sanders is doing here by politely saying, look, I like Joe Biden. He's my friend, but this is his record. This is mine. I think this is a great strategy, objectively speaking. So with that being said, um, I don't agree with Donna Brazil, but I do think it's important that we highlight why she's wrong, because what she's saying here is not true, because I don't think she understands progressives. She doesn't get it. She still believes, wrongly so, that Hillary Clinton defeated Bernie Sanders just because, you know, there was this disagreement and, you know, she won four million more votes than Bernie Sanders. And she talks about how, you know, Bernie Sanders calling out Hillary's poor record in 2016 didn't work. But I mean, it could have worked. You're the one who told us, Donna, about how the DNC was thoroughly in the tank for Hillary Clinton. I mean, she literally was controlling their press releases. You're the one who told us that. You gave us more details about how they tipped the scales against Bernie Sanders. So maybe it could have worked. He made up a 60-point deficit. So just strategically speaking, I think that Bernie Sanders is doing the correct thing here, but it's in the interest of the establishment, in the interest of Democratic Party elites like Donna Brazil, who I believe is a superdelegate, to say, don't do this, Bernie, because she knows that this will be conducive to a victory, potentially, if he keeps this up. Because there's nothing wrong with saying that your record is better than Joe Biden's. This is what we expect. And anyone who thinks that a primary is about holding hands and singing Kumbaya, they're just not in it to win it. And I get why you would want to keep this civil, because we all have a vested interest in defeating Donald Trump. But if you have a primary that gets especially brutal, that still doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose. Because look at the 2016 primary on the Republican side. It was brutal. Trump still won. Back in 2008, it was extremely brutal between Obama and Clinton. And Obama still won. So people... Essentially, when they say, this is what I, the way that I view this, when they say, Bernie, play nice, don't talk about Joe Biden's shit record, all they're essentially advocating for tacitly is for us to unilaterally disarm. Let's have you stop saying bad things about Joe Biden, but we're going to continue to have our stooges in the media talk badly about you and try to quote unquote expose you and criticize you nonstop. Well, we're not going to fall for it, and we're not going to take that bait. We're going to continue doing what you should be doing in a primary, and that is calling out the poor record of Bernie Sanders' opponents. So there's an article in Politico that I want to talk about because the Republican Party, they have a clear choice as to who they want to run against in 2020. Now, according to this article, Republicans pray for Bernie as Democratic nominee. Some GOP lawmakers would like nothing more than a Democratic Socialist to be the opposition's presidential nominee. Now, to me, I don't think they're being 100% truthful here. Like, we all know back in 2016, Hillary Clinton had this Pied Piper strategy where her and the Democrats would try to prop up Donald Trump because they thought that he was the more beatable Republican. And what Republicans are trying to communicate here to you is that they want to do the same for Bernie. They want to keep talking about democratic socialism. They want to put his ideas front and center because they think he's the easiest to beat. So let me read you the article, and then I'm going to tell you what I think is really going on here. As Burgess Everett writes, Republicans like their chances of keeping the Senate in 2020, but there's one thing they think would all but seal the deal. Bernie Sanders as the Democratic presidential nominee. Some GOP incumbents are practically cheering him on, confident there's no way a self-described Democratic Socialist could win a general election against President Donald Trump and that he'd drag other Democrats on the ballot with him. It would be good for us to have a nominee like that, said Senator Joni Ernst, who is up for re-election next year and sounded downright giddy about the prospect of Sanders representing Democrats at the top of the ticket. Trump and the Senate GOP have explicitly designed their 2020 strategy around Sanders, beating the anti-socialism drum incessantly and attempting to tether every Democrat on the ballot to what they call a creep away from capitalism and toward collectivism. And though he's consistently trailing former Vice President Joe Biden at this early stage, some top Republicans said they sincerely believe Sanders has a legitimate shot at winning. A lot of people think that in that crowded field, he could break out, said Senate Majority Whip 
John Thune. He added, if we can run a race against a person that's an out-of-the-closet socialist and promoting socialist ideas, it's a great contrast for us. The strategy shows Republicans are much more comfortable talking about Sanders and tying other Democrats to his brand of socialism than they are in defending this year's meager legislative agenda. But Republicans could be making the same mistake Democrats made Four years ago, when Trump launched his presidential campaign and they began salivating over the prospect of a Senate sweep. So on one hand, to try to look at this objectively speaking, I think that if you have a situation where the economy is running smoothly, we all know that it's not going so well for ordinary Americans. But if you can get the media to kind of parrot this claim that the economy is working wonderfully, then historically it has been the case that incumbent presidents have benefited from economies that are working well. So what they essentially are going to be pitching is, look, why would we change things up when the economy is going great? Unemployment is low. And why would you want to fundamentally change the economy in the way that Bernie Sanders does when it's currently working out for you? But the difference here is that the economy isn't actually working out for normal Americans. They're hurting. Americans are struggling. They're living paycheck to paycheck. So what Bernie will be able to do is touch on these aspects that other normal politicians would otherwise miss. Because if you're someone like Joe Biden or Amy Klobuchar, you're out of touch with normal Americans. So you won't know how to respond when Republicans try to run on this good economy, this quote unquote good economy. But Bernie actually will be able to peel away the layers and reach straight to voters and ask them how they're doing in this so-called good economy. And it's not too well. Now, getting to the article, do I believe that Republicans actually want to run against Bernie Sanders? Yes and no. On one hand, I think they're stupid enough to believe that this is a good idea, because if anybody is going to beat Donald Trump, it's going to be Bernie. I honestly believe that he has the best chance at beating Donald Trump, even if nobody is a sure bet. But I do think that they're naive enough to think that Maybe it would behoove them to have Bernie be the nominee, but at the same time, a large part of this, I think, is them bluffing. And the reason why I believe that's the case is because in this very first sentence, they kind of showed their cards. Quote, Republicans like their chances of keeping the Senate. Really? You like your chances of keeping the Senate? You do realize that Republicans have to defend 22 seats, whereas Democrats only have to defend 12. So if you like your chances... You're just delusional. Maybe they do keep the Senate. I don't know. But I'm just saying that the odds aren't in their favor just looking at the number of seats that they have to defend. So I think that when I see them say things like this, they're trying to act overconfident in order to scare Democrats because they know that Democrats are more than willing to try to sabotage their own if they think it'll help them win. So what Republicans here are trying to do, if they really are this strategic in playing three-dimensional chess, I think some are, they're trying to go Democrats into going to greater lengths to sabotage Bernie Sanders. Because what they're saying is, look guys, you don't want Bernie Sanders to be the nominee because we're going to kick your ass if that's the case. But really what they may be doing is just getting Democrats to do their job for them because they know Bernie actually is a threat. Bernie Sanders would have won in 2016 had he gone up against Donald Trump. I think most people can see that with a brain who looked at the numbers. And I think that Republican Party strategists, they're more strategically savvy than Democrats. So they've got to be cognizant of this fact. They've got to know that this isn't really a fight they want to have. If they want to keep the White House, odds are... Their best bet is going up against another corporate Democrat because we saw what happened. Trump can beat a corporate Democrat. Donald Trump can beat someone who's a centrist. So wouldn't they want to replicate the winning strategy for them? Wouldn't they want Democrats to put up someone like Biden? Well, of course they do. So what they're doing here is this is kind of something you have to read between the lines with to understand. They want to pretend like they're not afraid of Bernie when in actuality, they're bluffing. That's all that they're doing. Now, looking at hypothetical matchups, it's very clear that Bernie Sanders, obviously, according to aggregate polling data, is beating Donald Trump. Now, 
that could change, but currently he's outperforming Donald Trump. So really, I mean, <laughs> they should be careful what they wish for. And Bernie Sanders pretty much echoed that same sentiment, saying, I would suggest they underestimate me at their own peril, and I hope they do. Sanders said in an interview, Republicans are unlikely to run on their own forward-leaning agenda, he added, so they have to figure out some boogeyman that they think they can run against. And that's exactly it. Because look, do you honestly think that they're going to withhold from this socialist boogeyman strategy if Joe Biden is the nominee? Of course not. Mike Pence just claimed about a week or two ago in an interview that Joe Biden, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, he's advocating for socialist policy. So they're not just going to say, oh, well, shoot, I guess our hands are tied now that Biden is the nominee and we can't run on this socialist boogeyman. Of course, they're going to run on the socialist boogeyman. This is going to be their strategy. It's always their strategy. So why are we to believe that they're not going to use the same strategy they've used to run against Joe Biden? Again, look, for people like Joni Ernst, I think that when she's supposedly giddy, if I could hear her talk, I'm sure that we'd hear nervous laughter. Because if Bernie Sanders was, was at the top of the ticket, he would galvanize younger voters. He would get independents to come out and vote. And when more people turn out, Democrats win. And if a presidential candidate, if the person at the top of the ticket does really well, then that actually has a very positive effect on down ticket races. So I think that they're not as dumb as they're leading on. Some certainly are. But when they say this, when they say they're praying for Bernie to win, when they're essentially saying that Bernie's their Pied Piper, not buying it. I think they know what's coming if Bernie's the nominee. He has a phenomenal chance of beating Donald Trump. Um, and if I'm wrong and they actually do truly believe this, then like Bernie said, underestimate him at their own peril because um, I want them to underestimate him. I think it's evident that Joe Biden is still sailing and he's riding high on this announcement boost that he got. And data indicates that he actually has cut into Bernie Sanders' support base, meaning that people who would otherwise be supporting Bernie Sanders are now supporting Joe Biden since he decided to enter. Now, that is weird, but nonetheless, this is what the data indicates. So, my instinct when I see this is we need to try to grapple with this reality and take away from this information that allows us to reach these people. Because if you would have supported Bernie had Joe Biden not entered the race, then that tells me that you don't necessarily know about the policy differences. Now, there's a couple of polls that came out that asked Joe Biden supporters who would be their second choice in the event Joe Biden decided to not run. Now, before I tell you the results, if you had to guess, who would it be? Someone like Kamala, someone like Beto O'Rourke, Pete Buttigieg, because ideologically speaking, they're more closely aligned. However, according to a Harris X poll, that's not actually the case. According to Biden supporters, their second pick at 27% is surprisingly Bernie Sanders. So Joe Biden is number one, Bernie Sanders is their number two. In third, we have Kamala Harris at 15%, Beto O'Rourke in fourth at 11%, Pete Buttigieg following closely with 10%, Warren at 8%, Gillibrand at 7%, and Booker at 6%. Now, instinctively, you've got to be thinking, this must be an outlier. This must be the one poll that claims that Bernie Sanders really is Joe Biden's support base's second choice, right? Well, no, because according to a poll by the Morning Consult, it found that largely the same holds true, because Bernie Sanders is still Joe Biden supporter's second choice at 31%. Kamala, again, is in third with 13%. And here, Elizabeth Warren jumps a little bit, and she is their fourth choice at 10%. Now, one more poll that I want to show you is from Monmouth, which was conducted in mid-April, and it found that if Joe Biden didn't run, Bernie would have gained an additional seven points. So, taken as a whole, what this data indicates, what it tells us is that even if it's hard to believe, there's considerable overlap 
between Joe Biden's base of support and Bernie Sanders' base of support. Maybe not the core bases of support, but nonetheless, there's overlap there. Now, it's weird. If I were a mainstream media news pundit, what would I chalk this up to? Well, I'd say, you know, we can explain this away by the fact that voters just gravitate towards the old white men. And that's why they're opting for Joe Biden as their number one and Bernie Sanders as their number two and possibly vice versa. But that's not actually what I think is happening here. That's an oversimplification. In fact, I don't think it explains this at all. What I think is happening here is that Bernie Sanders now probably has the second highest name recognition. And what we really underestimate oftentimes in politics is how powerful an advantage candidates have if they have name recognition. I mean, look at 2016. Donald Trump defeated 17 or 16 Republican establishment candidates because every single person in the country knew who Donald Trump was. And now, who has the highest name recognition in the Democratic field? Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders. So if you're a voter and you just kind of vaguely think that all of the candidates are ideologically similar, who are you going to choose if you're not necessarily 100% behind one candidate? Well, you say, you know, Joe Biden, I liked him. I thought that, you know, the last eight years under Obama were okay. So uh, my second choice, I guess, would be Sanders. I don't think that they've put much thought into this, and I don't think this is about policy. I mean, it's obviously not about policy because ideologically, you have Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders who are complete opposites. So it can't be about policy. So in my mind, this is about name recognition, and the reason why Bernie Sanders is their number two is because they just know who Bernie Sanders is now. He's the most popular politician in America. So what this tells us is strategically, the way that we combat this and we make Bernie their number one is we educate these people about policy. If we are going and knocking on doors for Bernie, for phone banking and text banking for Bernie, we have an opportunity to convert these voters because this tells me that they haven't decided to back Biden 100% and they're still gettable. All we have to do is educate them about Bernie's platform, about his record, And I think these people are winnable. Now, another factor that I think is helping Biden here is he's still coasting off of the nostalgia from the Obama years. But what we need to do as Bernie supporters strategically is convince these people that there's a real fundamental difference between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders and how Bernie would actually improve their lives, whereas Joe Biden is about maintaining the status quo and how he's actually vulnerable. If electability is what people care about, which is another aspect, and maybe they're voting for Joe Biden because of electability, we need to convince them that we just tried this strategy. We just tried running a centrist like Joe Biden in 2016, and we have a reality television show star as president. So what we need to do is get someone who is the antithesis of Donald Trump, because that's going to be our best bet. That's going to be our ticket to the White House. So this is certainly um, a poll that is weird. It doesn't make sense at first, but if you think about it, just going off of name recognition, that is such a powerful force. And now thankfully, it's working to our advantage to a degree. However, Joe Biden, he just, he has more name recognition than Bernie. And as a result, in spite of his garbage record, this is really benefiting him. Being part of the Obama team, is benefiting him. So grapple with these polling results, look at this data, and don't just reject it. Try to adapt and figure out a way to reach these people because this is a good sign. If Bernie's their number two, they just are misinformed about the policy differences between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. So the goal as Sanders supporters is to reach them and ultimately convert them. Now, there's still time. The debates, I think, really is going to make or break this primary, but we need to do what we can to get the message out that if you are in support of these popular policies like Medicare for All, Biden does not support them. Biden does not believe we should legalize marijuana nationwide. He's out of touch. So we have to tell them and educate them about Joe Biden. And I think it's as easy as that. Now, maybe we'll get other results that demonstrate maybe it's not name recognition. Maybe, 
you know, um, it's some other reason. But nonetheless, this is what we have currently to work with, and we need to use this information to our advantage and win these people over. Simply put, win them over. So there's this trend that I've been seeing on YouTube lately that I really like. I find it entertaining where other YouTubers will rank things that, you know, are of interest to them. Characters in Game of Thrones, fast food restaurants, other YouTubers. And I thought that since this is a political YouTube channel, it would make sense for me to kind of do my own ranking of the 2020 Democratic Party primary contenders. And as you can see here, we have the different categories. We have the S tier, which is obviously the best. It's top tier. And then we have the F tier, which obviously is the worst of the worst. Now, this is not me ranking them based on numbers. I think that we all know that Bernie Sanders is my first choice, but this isn't me saying this is my number one, my number two, so on and so forth. This is essentially me just categorizing the candidates based on how good they are. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so the very first one we have here is Governor of Washington, Jay Inslee. Thus far, I'm not super impressed by him. He hasn't really laid out um, anything other than saying that he wants to tackle climate change, which is phenomenal. This is a really important issue. But the problem is that why would we opt for him when there are other people who are better when it comes to this issue? I mean, Bernie Sanders is championing the Green New Deal. Tulsi Gabbard has introduced her own climate change legislation, the OFF Act. So why would I choose him? over them when there are better people on this issue but nonetheless the fact that he wants to raise awareness about this issue is still important so he's certainly not s tier he's not the worst of the worst but i'm gonna put him in about mid-range um i'm gonna put him as c here because you know i just i i'm not interested in what he has to say if you're only talking really about one issue and you don't have the credibility needed on that one issue Okay, so the next person here is Mike Gravel, former Alaska senator, meme god, and I've said this before in the program, I actually agree with his platform more than pretty much anyone else. Um, better, It's better than Bernie's, it's better than Tulsi's, just objectively speaking. So in my view, this really is S tier, because he has the gold standard, he has the best platform in my view, and he goes further than people like Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard, even when it comes to their strengths. Like, he supports not using drones, which is something that is incredibly important to me. He explicitly is saying that Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and um, Julian Assange should be pardoned. Now, Tulsi Gabbard has also sp spoken out about this, but just overall, when you look broadly at his platform, I think he has the best. Now, I feel comfortable putting him in the S tier because he actually doesn't want to be president. But just objectively speaking, if I had to rank the candidates based on how good their platform is, I mean, if I don't put him in S tier, I feel like this would be a crime. Next person, Andrew Yang. So I like Andrew Yang. I was part of the Yang gang from the beginning. I have an Andrew uh, Yang pin or actually two of them over here. And I think that he is extremely honest. He's truthful. However, I just don't agree with the policy ideas that he's proposing he doesn't support medicare for all he's in favor of a public option instead and i'm worried about his version of universal basic income i think that if you're introducing universal basic income and it's supplementing existing social safety net programs and you don't have to choose between ubi and social security i would support him a lot more he'd be like nearly top tier for me but because he's not doing that yet until he proposes a plan to you know improve social security lift the tap the, the uh cap on taxable income then um you know he's not he's not a first choice for me we'll just say that so i'm gonna put him in b tier because he still has a lot of great ideas like ranked choice voting and whatnot but you know his main pitch of ubi i don't agree with the way he wants to implement that moving on we have Mary Ann Williamson. So this is someone overall who, um, I think she's a really nice person. Um, she doesn't support Medicare for all. She made this clear in an interview on the Jimmy Dore show. And 
if you don't support Medicare for all, I, I just, I'm sorry, I, I lose interest in you. I lose interest in you. But with that being said, she still has one strong policy that I really do support. She uh, believes in reparations for American descendants of slavery. Now, I actually think her plan is fairly meager. She's pitching $100 billion over 10 years, so $10 billion per year. And I think that they're owed more than that. I think we can do better. And also, I don't know that she's been explicit about that being a check. So I don't know for sure. Like, I, I previously gave her credit for being the best on this issue, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'm going to put her in B because this is the tier where you have one policy that I really like, but overall, I just can't get behind you because you don't check the boxes that I need you to check, namely Medicare for all. And also, I think she needs to lay off the platitudes because it is irritating to me. Um, she talks a lot about, you know, love and whatnot, but you've got to read the room. This is not an election where running on love, quote unquote, love, whatever you want to mean by that is going to win. Like, we are in a burn shit down era in politics. We don't feel love, we feel hatred. And we want someone who's going to destroy the establishment. And, you know, I said the same thing about Beto O'Rourke with his platitude, so the same is going to be applicable to Marianne Williamson. Next person here. Elizabeth Warren. So, I like Elizabeth Warren. Um, however, <laughs> with that being said... The problem that I have with Elizabeth Warren is that she won't unequivocally support Medicare for All. I mean, she's co-sponsored Bernie's Medicare for All bill, but anytime she's asked about it, she runs away from it. She says, well, yeah, I also co-sponsor, you know, a public option bill and lowering the age of Medicare down to 55, and I don't like that. However, I still think she's a phenomenal candidate. She proposed canceling some student loan debt. She keeps coming out with these really innovative policy ideas that I hadn't previously thought about, and I like her. The one thing that scares me about Elizabeth Warren is I don't know that she'd have the political courage to fight for anything. Like, we saw how she didn't have the courage to endorse Bernie Sanders. She didn't have the courage to stand up for the Standing Rock activists back in 2016 when they were being brutalized by militarized police. So I worry about her willingness to fight. With that being said, I still think that she is good enough to be an A tier because I genuinely believe that she's principled. Uh, fighting for what she wants to get implemented is a whole other story. But with that being said, um, you know, I like Elizabeth Warren. Next person, Eric Swalwell. So this Felicia is one of the 1,000 centrists who is running. And basically he's running on gun control, which is an issue I can get behind. But every single candidate supports gun reform. So this isn't really something that you're really setting yourself apart with. Like when it comes to someone like Tulsi Gabbard, I think it's incredibly brilliant for her to run on ending regime change wars because you have like one or two other candidates, if we're being extra charitable, who believe that we should do this. So that's innovative. This isn't very innovative to me. And also he's more of a centrist. He doesn't support Medicare for all. Um, he's just not great. Overall, I'm going to put him in the E tier. Um, because I don't think he is the worst of the worst. There's certainly worse out there, but he just, you know, um, we could do better than Eric Swalwell. Next person is Bernard. I am a brother of the Bernard. You all know, it looks like, you know, behind me, a Bernie Sanders fan club. Um, but Bernie Sanders is someone who I've supported since 2010 when I saw his epic filibuster on the house floor. And I just, I just knew that this guy was principled. And the more you dig into his record, the more you love him. He supports Medicare for all. He's the strongest on Medicare for all, which is my number one issue. And for that, you've got to give it up to him. Now, there are things that I disagree with Bernie Sanders on. He has got to improve when it comes to Israel-Palestine. But with that being said, sadly, he's still one of the best. He doesn't support BDS, but he still is more forceful in condemning Israel and what they do to Palestinians, the way that they kill them indiscriminately. He called Netanyahu a racist. And also, he has previously stated he'd kind of support drones. Now, he did make it clear that he'd take precautions to minimize civilian casualties, but nonetheless just end the program. It's illegal. Congress has not declared these drone wars. So, the executive should not be able to unilaterally wage war. This is the whole point of Bernie Sanders, you know, 
touting, you know, his bill on Yemen, which was fantastic. But with that being said, these disagreements aside, they're not deal breakers by no means. And these are just a couple of disagreements. I agree with Bernie Sanders on the overwhelming majority of policies. And I think that he's the one person who actually knows how to get his legislative agenda implemented in the event he becomes president. He's the only person who truly wants to get us to social democracy. And even if his platform in and of itself is not as good as Mike Ravel's, just out of pure strategy, out of consistency, he's definitely S-tier. Phenomenal candidate, as you all know. I mean, it's not like I have to convince you guys, because you already know how I feel about Bernie, but he's great. Next person, another Felicia here. We have Tim Ryan. Now, Tim Ryan, if you'll recall, he challenged Nancy Pelosi in uh, I believe 2016, um, or maybe it wasn't 2016. Basically, he was running against Nancy Pelosi to be speaker. But even if we don't like Nancy Pelosi as progressives because she's a conservative, if you could believe it, he was challenging her from the right. So he's a conservative. I see no reason why he wants to run. Um, I don't think there's really a place for him. Um, so I'm going to put him in the F tier. He's basically the worst that we can possibly do. I don't care. Um, and really, he's not that much different from Eric Swalwell, Swalwell here. Um, but, I mean, what are you running on? Like, at least with Eric Swalwell, he has something that he's running on. Like, he says, I want gun reform because that's the one thing that won't offend the plethora of special interests that contribute to his campaign because he's not going to be taking money from, you know, GOA or NRA. But, I mean, it's something. What is Tim Ryan offering? What is he running on? I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, incrementalism, more neoliberalism, no thanks. So not not cool with him. Beto O'Rourke. This is someone who, he's bad. <laughs> he's just so bad. Um, he's pretty much an empty vessel. I feel like he doesn't have any ideas, any platforms. And if you put him in power, what he's going to carry out, his agenda, will essentially be dictated by his advisors. He'd be the left equivalent of Donald Trump. Now, he has some great ideas. He wants to legalize marijuana. Awesome. Uh, he did support Medicare for All, and then once he decided to run, flipped on it. Um, he, however, is raising money based on bundlers. You know, he is teaming up with oligarchs who donate to Democrats. He's just someone who is not consistent and overall has a very conservative record. Now, in the race against Ted Cruz, I was incredibly supportive of him because I would literally, I would support a turd over Ted Cruz. And I'm not being hyperbolic. If you gave me the choice between Ted Cruz and a literal piece of shit, I would vote for that piece of shit over Ted Cruz. So, I mean, I supported him back then, but in 2020, I don't know why he's running. And I don't think he knows why he's running. And that is, you know... um, it shows why he face-planted, because he is vacuous. He has nothing. Um, so I'm going to put him in the C tier. Certainly not the worst of the worst. Certainly not the best of the best. I, I'm kind of... I kind of want to move him to D tier, because he's really bad. Yeah, I'm going to move him to D tier, just because I don't know what he's running on. Besides legalizing marijuana, which I support, I don't know what... He's running on. I don't know why Beto O'Rourke feels like he's the person who, you know, um, should win when he doesn't really have new ideas. Okay, so let's go to Seth Moulton, another one of the Felicias. I consider the F category the Felicia category, a bunch of white dudes with basically the same policy. I mean, they should really, I, I saw a tweet about this. These guys should all be running as one person because they're the same fucking person. But Seth Moulton, he's someone who tried to challenge Nancy Pelosi um, from the right. And that failed spectacularly. I believe he got booed by his own constituents at a town hall. He recently came out against Medicare for All and said he supports a public option um, in addition to the ACA. I just, I don't, I don't know why he's running. Um, there's no really one signature issue that sets him apart. So he goes in the F tier. The only reason why, and to be clear, the reason why I'm not putting Swalwell in the F tier is because, I mean, these guys don't have something that they're running on that is noticeable, at least. Again, Swalwell says guns. That's something that tells me that you have one reason why you're running, even if it's something that isn't that innovative, you know, or wouldn't be super transformative. It's something, you know, so 
credit where it's due, but yeah, Molten is one of the Felicias. The next person is Wayne Massam. Now, this is someone who I don't know too much about, but I will say this. He is basically an incrementalist. He doesn't support Medicare for All. He, you know, he wants to get dark money out of politics. He He's more of an incrementalist, with the exception of one policy that is amazing. He goes further than Elizabeth Warren when it comes to student loan debt cancellation. He actually straight up is adopting Jill Stein's policy. We take the $1.5 trillion that 45 million Americans or 44 million Americans hold, cancel all of it, full stop. Now, for that, I'm going to put him in the B category. Because that is such a bold thing to run on that I've got to give you credit there because if you are running on something that bold, that really does set you apart. Like, look at these people. We have in the B category, we have Yang. He's running on UBI, which I support in theory, just not necessarily his implementation. We have Williamson, who supports reparations. Um, I think it's not the best reparations proposal that we can come up with. It's still something that I support. And we have Massam with um, student loan debt cancellation. So in the B tier, what I kind of see here, um, based on my own trend of categorizing these people, is they're, by and large, you know, they have one big policy that really sets them apart from the rest of the field, and I think it's fair to put Massam in this category. Um, so we have Amy Klobuchar, another Felicia candidate. Um, I don't know why she's running. Um, I don't know why she chose to eat salad with a comb. <laughs> And I will never get past that. I'm sorry. Never, ever, ever going to get past that. Um, I don't know where to put her. Let's see. She's certainly in the Felicia category. I think she's part of the white men who should be running as one person. But with that being said, she actually is proposing some policy ideas. She's like a boring version of Elizabeth Warren where she's talking about, you know, having these savings accounts for your uh, tuition. It's incredibly bad, just incrementalist, neoliberal nonsense. But, I mean, it's she's trying, I guess. So I'll put her in the E category, I guess. I don't know. See, she kind of... It could go either way. She could be in the F category. She could be in the E category. But I'll be extra kind and I'll put her in the E category. Just because she has given me joy because of this salad with a comb kerfuffle that I can't stop talking about and uh, thinking about. Next person, John Hickenlooper. He watched porn uh, with his mom. F. He also compared Bernie Sanders' policies to Stalin's. Um, so I think that he's just... Not a bright guy. Um, former governor of Colorado, I think, would know the difference between Stalin <laughs> and Bernie. But nonetheless, he is uh, feigning ignorance here. And he watched porn with his mom. Nope. Kamala Harris. Oops, I just flipped her. Sorry, hang on. Okay. Kamala Harris. She is someone who I consider her the best of the worst. She's definitely a corporate Democrat, but she stands out among all of the other corporate Democrats because she, I believe, is more politically astute. She's more savvy when it comes to strategy, and she knows that she has to do two things. One, she knows she can't piss off her donors in the Democratic Party if she wants to win, but she also knows that she can't piss off progressives like Hillary Clinton did if she wants to win. So she's savvy. She knows what she's doing, and she's certainly more charismatic than the other corporate Democrats. I'm going to go ahead and put her in the C tier. Um, if there was any Democrat that stood out, or really that remained, you know, it, let's just picture this situation where it is March, and there's two candidates left, and Bernie was there obviously running against another corporate Democrat, which is what I think will probably happen. That's how the race will be consolidated. One progressive, one corporatist. I would hope it's Kamala Harris because at least she is better than the rest of them. Okay, next person, Kirsten Gillibrand. Pretty much the same is true for Kirsten Gillibrand. She comes out in favor of really bold policies like abolishing ICE, but at the same time, even though she knows, like Kamala, that she can't piss off progressives and her donors simultaneously, and she's trying to 
walk this fine line. The problem is that she goes against her own better judgment. Like she just had a fundraiser with a big pharma executive. That's completely unacceptable in 2020 in an anti-establishment election. So for that, she's not as good as Kamala Harris in my view. Um, she also doesn't want to get rid of the filibuster. And I just don't think she's as malleable as someone like Kamala Harris. Like worst case scenario, Kamala Harris is elected. Well, that's actually not the worst case scenario, but in not the best case scenario where Bernie is elected, I think that Kamala would be easier to persuade to do certain policies than Kirsten Gillibrand. Because once she's elected, I feel like she just pretty much tells us to fuck off. Whereas with Kamala Harris, I think she would be more mindful of the fact that she needs to maintain the support of the progressive base if she wants to be you know effective as a leader because if you lose our support we're not going to make phone calls for you we're not going to come out and canvas for you so harris knows this harris is more aware she's more in tune with the base i think so for that reason i think that Gillibrand, she kind of is in this detour we're just not great but not the worst next person tulsi gabbard now tulsi gabbard is someone who i really really admire she is just she carved out this lane for herself and you've got to give her credit she's running on ending the regime change wars now like bernie sanders i don't think she's perfect i wish that she would include ending the drone wars as part of her platform but with that being said she's pretty much an amazing candidate she's nearly perfect now i do have other criticisms of tulsi gabbard but none of them like bernie sanders are deal breakers but with that being said tulsi gabbard for my number one issue she doesn't speak to this enough she's one of two people that hasn't backed away from medicare for all but what i'm looking for is for her to explicitly say we need to do away with private health insurance companies because that's really the way that you secure a very stable single payer system now she doesn't necessarily have to say let's make private insurance supplemental insurance illegal but i mean the goal is to craft a single payer system that is so good that they basically go out of business and when it comes to you know more elective procedures things that you might need to finance like braces or breast augmentation for example things that aren't you know of concern for your health i mean you finance this you don't really need insurance for that either but with that being said um i'm not gonna get too nitpicky because tulsi's phenomenal she's an amazing candidate i'm gonna put her in the a tier now she's here with warren for me and i kind of feel like she's a step above warren in my view like i've been struggling genuinely about who's my number two if there was like a tier between s and a um i would probably put gabbard there and leave warren in a and the main reason why I do this is because Gabbard doesn't run away from Medicare for all, like Warren. And Gabbard is also someone who is strong. Like, I genuinely believe that if she says we're going to end regime change wars, if she gets elected, she's ending the regime change wars. And if the establishment and media want to fight her on that, she's not going to back down from that fight. Because I believe that Tulsi Gabbard, she has political courage. She endorsed Bernie. Warren did not. She went to Standing Rock in 2016. Warren did not. So Gabbard, really, she sets herself apart by being bold, by being strong, by being courageous, and by really just having this amazing platform when it comes to ending regime change wars. And if you watched an ad that she put out where somebody went to one of her rallies and was crying because of her stance on regime change wars and how much that meant to this person, she really had this intimate moment where she hugged that person it was phenomenal. Tulsi is really, she's great. So she's definitely A tier um, with Elizabeth Warren. Okay, John Delaney. <sighs> one of the Felicias who should be running as one person. F tier. He really is not running on anything. And there's no excitement for his campaign. Like if you look at some of the photos that he's posting on his Twitter, there's like five people that show up to his events. Like, literally. I don't know why he's running. He uh, He's just seemingly an anti-Trump person and wants to get elected to restore decorum. Okay, but what does that do for us? You're going to do the same, largely, you know, largely the same policies as Trump, but nicer? Who cares? <laughs> I want change, and he doesn't want to change the system. So he's basically worst of the worst. 
Um, next person, Julian Castro. Um, I'm gonna put him in C. I think that this guy is a weasel, but he's not the worst of the corporate Democrats. He actually is paying lip service to the idea of Medicare for all. However, I don't believe he'd actually implement it. I don't believe he would fight for that. He's talking a big game when it comes to reparations. Don't believe he'd actually push for that. In fact, he criticized Bernie for not going far enough on reparations when he basically signaled support for the same thing that Bernie Sanders supports. So this guy is a weasel, but with that being said, I think he, like Kamala, knows he needs to at least, at a, min at a minimum, pander to progressives. And I don't like being pandered to, but you've got to give him credit for the effort at least, I guess. Um, actually, I'm kind of, I'm kind of rethinking C. Do I move him? To D. Yeah, I'm going to move him to D. This dude's a corporate Democrat. He came from Obama's administration. He's a corporate Democrat. Okay, next person. Pete Buttigieg. Um, he is D. Actually, he, you know what? He may even be E. Actually, no, no, no. I'll tell you why I'm going to put him in D. So, even though he's a centrist, he does have some good ideas that I support. First of all, he supports getting rid of the Electoral College. Don't need to support him for that, though, because Elizabeth Warren agrees. He also has a really good court-packing plan that would add six more justices to the Supreme Court, but also move to depoliticize the Supreme Court. I really like that plan. However, he's not going in this category in the B tier with Massam. Williamson and Yang, because the problem with Buttigieg is even though he has this one policy that I really like, he also has some ideas that I absolutely disagree with. Like, first of all, he's not great on Venezuela. He basically is pro-meddling. He floated the idea of compulsory national service. Fuck out of here. Hate that idea. Hate that policy. And he also said that candidates need to talk more about their values and put that front and center rather than talking about policies. No, thank you. Okay, Cory Booker. He's someone who I'd also put in the D tier. He's basically indistinguishable from the rest of these people. In fact, you know what? You could make the case that he belongs in E tier basically because of that vote for, um, or the vote against Amy Klobuchar's bill, and it's funny that she's lower than him, to allow us to import cheaper prescription drugs from Canada. But the difference is that he co-sponsored Medicare for All. Will he actually deliver Medicare for All as president? No way, because he's already moved away like Kamala Harris from it. But he's just a lot more corporatist than someone like Kamala Harris, I think. And they're both corporatist. But there's something unique about Booker in that he's such a slime ball that I really don't believe anything that he has to say. Um, so with Kamala, I believe that she'd get in and she'd try to maintain at least some level of support from progressives. Like, she'd offer us a few concessions, whereas Booker would just be another Democrat like Bill Clinton and Obama, where he's just going to work to appease his donors. So we got a couple left. Joe Biden. Joe Biden is F-tier. He essentially is the worst of the worst. In fact, if I could put him in a lower tier than f I would do it because Joe Biden has basically been on the wrong side of every single issue. While Bernie Sanders was protesting segregation, he was making speeches in favor of segregation functionally. He was on the wrong side of history when it comes to DOMA. He voted to federally ban same-sex marriage. Now he's come around and I welcome your evolution, but nonetheless, at that time, Bernie Sanders was on the right side of that issue. He voted for NAFTA. He was in support of the TPP. He voted for permanent normal trade relations with China. He's basically a hawk. He's a conservative corporate Democrat. And this guy is a paper tiger. He likes to talk tough. He likes to make it seem as if he's the best bet to go against Donald Trump because he has a big mouth. But that, that doesn't mean anything. You just have a big mouth and that's that. So Joe Biden is the worst of the worst, and I truly hope that Democrats defeat him because in the event he becomes the nominee, well, we're replicating the same strategy that cost us 2016, right? And I say us 
loosely because I don't necessarily associate myself with Democrats. I'm more of an independent, but I have to register as a Democrat because I'm in a closed primary state. So I'm not going to be able to vote for Bernie if I don't register as a Democrat. So temporarily, at least for all intents and purposes, I'm a Democrat. And if we don't beat him, we replicate the same strategy in 2016. Put up a corporatist who we know Trump has the capacity to defeat. Not a fan. Last person here. Bennett. He's a senator and he's another fallacia. Basically running on the same thing that the rest of the fallacias are running on. I'm going to put him in F tier. And largely for the same reasons that, you know, I, I categorized Seth Moulton and Tim Ryan here as well. Um, he just isn't really running on anything. It's more incrementalism. It's, you know, these half measures. And if you're not running with these big ideas to fundamentally change the system, or if you come up short there, if you're not running with one really strong policy proposal, then why are you even running? So in this category here, F and E, these people, these eight people should all be running as one person because they're functionally the same thing. And I'm fully aware of the fact that you could almost put Buttigieg and O'Rourke here. But because they have a couple of good ideas, like, you know, we have abolishing the Electoral College, legalizing marijuana, also legalizing marijuana. That's why they're kind of in this category. Um, and with the E category, you know, we have these neoliberals proposing incrementalist ideas, but I mean, it's something. These guys aren't doing shit. They're basically just, they're running because they're running. <laughs> there's, there's no driving core ideology behind them. They're vacuous. They're vapid. They're, you know, they're not talking about policies. What are you running on? Why are you running? So overall, let's just kind of take a moment here because we have everyone now and for the most part, as you can see, just overall, I'm not too uh, big of a fan of most of the contenders. Half of the field is in, you know, these lower tiers because they suck. They're not great. But in this higher tier, you know, it's you're never going to have a candidate who is perfect, who agrees with you on everything. But with these four candidates, we're pretty damn close. Like we're we're pretty fucking close. I mean, you have Bernie Sanders who is a revolutionary, who actually wants social democracy, which in my view is important. And just getting us on the trajectory of social democracy, even if he gets one one hundredth of his agenda implemented, I think is better than what everyone else is proposing. You have Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard, who I would love to vote for. In the event they won, I would enthusiastically support either one of them. And then you have Mike Ravel, who has a phenomenal platform, but doesn't actually want to be, you know, president. But if he's going to promote progressive policy ideas on that debate stage, I'm behind it. And then you have people who I generally admire, probably Miss Sam less so than Yang and Williamson. But, you know, their one bold idea isn't enough to get my support. And then you have these mid-range candidates who are just, eh, don't like them, but um, they're certainly the best of the worst here. So that is my thoughts on this. I'm curious to know how you guys rank the candidates. And listen, um, I'm fully aware of the fact that many people will disagree with this and you can disagree. Um, you could really make the case in some instances that the E people belong in the F tier. You can make the case that Warren and Gabbard belong in the S tier. You can make the case that Sanders belongs in the A tier and Mike Gravel alone should be in the S tier. There's a lot of ways that you can cut it, but this is just my personal view. By and large, these four candidates here, they're my people. I like them and um, I think they're great. So I know it's gonna, going to kind of be like a pain in the ass to type this out in the comments, but I am curious to see how close we agree. And I also want to know what other political commentators think. So I hope to see Kyle Kalinske, Rational National, Jimmy Dore, Nico House, Tim Black, Kim Iverson, Anna Kasparian, uh, Michael Brooks. I want to see everyone do the same thing. Um, just because I'm, I'm curious because, you know, this is, it's tricky. We have so many candidates running that I think that these types of exercises, it is helpful because when you kind of can put them all out here like this and really visualize what tier they belong in and how good of a candidate they are, I do believe it is 
helpful. But with that being said, people are probably going to disagree with this, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but, you know, this is this is my categorization. This is how I rank the candidates. Um, but I'm curious to know what you think. And I'm sorry, you know, I don't like name drop dropping other political commentators because you're almost always going to leave someone out, which pisses people off. So if I left you out, then um, I don't mean any harm by it. I, I'm not doing that on purpose. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm curious to see how other people would categorize the candidates. My next thing, I think, is... I'm thinking about ranking them just one through 21 or 22, however many people are running and seeing, you know, who's my number one and who is my number 22. Um, because that's something that's also interesting, but I'm still genuinely struggling when it comes to who's my um, number two or number three, if you include, you know, Gravel, but I don't really put him as my number one because he doesn't actually want to be president. So I've ranked Bernie as number one. And I'm still, I go back and forth between Warren and Gabbard because on one hand, I like Warren's student loan debt cancellation plan, but I like that Gabbard talks more about regime change wars. I trust that Gabbard will fight and has more courage than Warren. So it's a struggle for me. You know, um, I've, I've gone back and forth, so I don't know how I would rank them. I'd probably still tie them overall because they're both excellent candidates and I like them both very much. I bought t-shirts for them both. I bought buttons for them both. And I love them. But, you know, Bernie's definitely my number one. Um, and, yeah, after that, it gets a little bit tricky. But anyways, I'm going to stop talking. This is uh, my rankings. Two of the country's most popular politicians are teaming up to introduce legislation that I think is actually really phenomenal and it's innovative. And if this were to pass, it really would be great. So as Renee Merle of the Washington Post reports, Senator Bernie Sanders and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez will introduce legislation on Thursday to cap credit card interest rates at 15 percent, a steep reduction from current levels. Americans have more than one trillion in credit card debt, according to the Federal Reserve. In addition to a 15 percent federal cap on interest rates for credit cards and other consumer loans, states could establish their own lower limits under the legislation. It would also allow the U.S. Postal Service to get into the banking business, including offering savings and checkings accounts. So that last little bit there, I really like. Bernie Sanders floated this idea, I believe, back in 2016, I want to say. And I love the idea of allowing the U.S. Postal Service to basically act as small community banks. I think that's a fantastic idea. And capping the interest rates of credit cards really is important when you see how high these interest rates really are. So if you have good credit, then you're looking at about 17, 18% interest rates. If you have poor credit, you're looking at nearly 25% interest rates. So even if you have good credit, no blemishes on your record, you're still going to be looking at a 17 to 18% interest rate for credit cards. That is absolutely astronomical, and it's easy to see how these companies are ripping Americans off. So I think that this is necessary, and this actually isn't a new proposal because back in the 1980s, this was the cap that was imposed on credit unions. So basically, what Bernie Sanders and AOC, what they're doing is they're just saying, look, Let's go back to the way things were. This is the same thing that they are doing when it comes to new tax proposals. Like AOC is saying, look, let's go back to the time when the marginal tax rate was 70%. Now, in actuality, it was higher. It was more like 90%. But by basically saying, let's go back, you're trying to not scare people. Because anytime there's this new sweeping change, people tend to think, well, look, I don't know how this is going to affect me personally, so I'd rather just opt for no change rather than change that I'm unfamiliar with. So what they're doing here is really clever. They're basically saying, we're just going to go back to a time when things worked because we knew what that policy produced. The results were fantastic. So that's all that we're proposing. And I think that that's a clever way to govern if you are trying to cultivate popular support for your policy. Now, the banking industry made more than $100 billion dollars based on interest rates and fees last year alone. And that's a 35% increase since 2012. So this is a much needed change. And I'm really glad that they're teaming up because it's nice to see the two most popular politicians in America do something and introduce a policy that 
is one needed, but two will likely get public support because they're introducing it. So I love this, love that they're teaming up here. I love that AOC is endorsing this idea as well. I'd like for her to endorse a particular politician currently, so maybe think about that AOC. Be nice if you uh, give Bernie Sanders a helping hand, especially now that Biden is surging, and we all know that Biden would be awful. But nonetheless, getting back to the subject at hand, love the policy idea. I think it's brilliant. And I want more 2020 presidential candidates to keep pushing the envelope. Every single week, we should be seeing new ideas. I think Elizabeth Warren really is setting the bar in terms of in introducing new policies. And this is really what you've got to do. If you want to garner interest for your presidential campaign, you've got to keep it fresh. You've got to keep the policies coming. And this is what Bernie's doing. And um, I'm glad that he's teaming up with AOC here. They're a great combo. And uh, I hope that this will get passed if Democrats are able to take back the Senate in 2020. So CNN's Alison Camerota had another one of her voter panels. And I always find these incredibly fascinating and really insightful because even if the sample sizes of these are small, it's still important for us to look at these anecdotes and try to take away whatever information that could be helpful because we need to be talking to average people who aren't necessarily in our bubbles. She talked to a small group of six voters from the state of Pennsylvania, and this really left me conflicted, I'll say that, because on one hand, it gave me hope but it also simultaneously crushed that hope. So we'll start out with the good and end on a negative note, <laughs> which maybe won't be the best idea, but I think that it's better to talk about this first part. So one of my fears going into 2020 and why I thought that Donald Trump is probably stronger than he was back in 2016, even if we've seen that his presidency has been a disaster, is because incumbent presidents always benefit just because they have that incumbent advantage. And second of all, historically speaking, if you just look at presidential elections, whenever the economy is performing well, the incumbent president always benefits from that. However, my theory was that Donald Trump wouldn't necessarily benefit from the good economy because this economy, it may be going really well for the stock markets and whatnot, but just because large multinational corporations are bringing in record profits doesn't mean that ordinary Americans are doing great. And my initial thought was that this economy won't benefit him because normal people aren't feeling the benefits of what is supposed to be a thriving economy. And what this panel showed me was that they actually, they get it. They don't feel the benefits of the Trump economy, and they vocalized that. And this gave me hope that Trump won't get that incumbent and good economy advantage. Take a look. How do you guys feel about how the economy is doing in Pennsylvania? I mean, the economy, um, by all metrics, is booming. Being in Pennsylvania, do you feel it? Why are you I, shaking I, your I'm head? I'm shaking till? my head because we know the statistics show one thing, but everybody I talk to, okay, uh, they're struggling to pay their mortgage to put their kids through college. To me, the middle class is struggling, and that's a fact. It seems that the gap is widening. There are so many people in Pennsylvania that are doing better, but they were already doing marginally well. And then there are people who are falling off the ladder, who are losing hope every day. But again, there's the inequity, and to me, that's the problem. You know, I guess the question the is, will is President right. Trump be able to win on that this time? Because the economy is doing so well, do voters feel it enough that he will have an easy path to a second? I don't think so. No, I don't feel like that he should win it at all because like, you're not, you're not voicing the voice of the people when you say that it's booming. Like, it's, who are you speaking for? I work with kids. I talk to parents every day who cannot get by, live check to check, and are working three different jobs trying to support one child. That's not fair. And then you have me with my experience. I dropped out of college. I had to. I couldn't afford it. My mother couldn't afford it. So it's just like you can't come to my face and tell me something is booming and I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I am thankfully still in college and I'm very fortunate to be there. When I graduate, I cannot imagine that I will not be paying off my student loans until the day I die. What's your plan for that? 
Great question. I don't know. I literally, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, we live in a society that tells kids to go to college, and I think that is fine. And now there's a huge bubble of debt, and none of us have any idea what we're going to do about it. People are not feeling this uh, economic boom because they're struggling yeah. to get their kids through school, to pay the mortgage, to pay the bills. We need a candidate that understands the struggle, who's not somebody who's rich and had a silver spoon in their mouth, but understands what it means to raise a family to struggle in America. So that was really insightful, and it honestly made me feel a little bit relieved because Donald Trump should not be given credit for an economy that is working out fantastically for elites, but the poor are struggling. They're living paycheck to paycheck, and this is what these people said. One person said the statistics statistics show one thing but everybody i talk to they're struggling to pay their mortgage to put their kids through college exactly so people in the media they can talk about how wonderful the economy is doing under donald trump and how low the unemployment rate is but if people aren't feeling the benefits of a good economy they're gonna know it you can't gaslight them here because they know firsthand whether or not this economy is working out well for them. And if their paychecks aren't any bigger, you can't lie to them and convince them that that isn't actually the case. Another person said, you're not voicing the voice of the people when you say it's booming. Who are you speaking for? I work with kids, I talk to parents every day who can't get by, they live check to check, they're working three different jobs to support one child. So you can't come to my face and tell me it's booming when I'm not where I'm supposed to be. That was great insight there because this really is how normal people feel. And the people who I talk to who aren't necessarily politically savvy, they're saying the same thing. They're saying I'm struggling. I can't get by. I can't afford the prescription that I need. I'm struggling to pay rent. And the girl who made this point said that she dropped out of college. And then there was another person who said that he's still in college, but doesn't really know if he's going to ever be able to pay off his student loan debt and thinks that he'll be burdened with it forever. And somebody said, look, people are not feeling the economic boom. So this gives me hope that if Donald Trump chooses to run on the Trump economy, and I'm assuming he will, it's not going to resonate with people. Because back in 2016, he had the credibility as an outsider to say, look, politicians haven't been looking out for you, which is why you're so desperate. They've been passing NAFTA, and now they want to pass the TPP. But now, if he's going to run on the Trump economy and say, look how great you're doing, they're going to be able to recognize, wait, I'm not doing so great. I'm not actually doing as well as you're telling me I'm doing because I see that the rich are getting richer. I see that large multinational corporations are making record profits, but my paychecks are still the same. So this gives me hope. But now it's time for us to completely destroy that hope because these people, they've adequately diagnosed the problem, but do they know what the solution would be? Take a look at who they're going to opt for. Are they going to choose a candidate who's actually going to fundamentally transform the system so we aren't desperate, so we aren't living paycheck to paycheck? Not so much. I know it's early days, but if the election were held today, who would you vote for? Alex. Elizabeth Warren, without question. She has policy plans. She knows what she's doing. She knows where she wants to go. She has a bold vision for the future, and she wants to bring all of us with. I'd probably vote for Joe Biden. I love Kamala Harris. I like Bernie. I like Elizabeth Warren. I think Elizabeth Warren is probably the smartest, but I'm going with who I think in the long run is going to present a vision, who's going to unify the country. Pat? Kamala Harris. I think she uh, provides a contrast to what, to what Trump is. I think she provides a great opportunity to, uh, to win. Definitely Kamala Harris. Not only is she a woman, but she's also a woman of color. I feel like that she has the energy, she has the plan, she has the mindset to go against somebody so disgusting. I will vote for her as well, although I love her, um, Elizabeth Warren's ideas. And why do you like Kamala Harris more than Elizabeth Warren? Just the fact, um, I think she represents something else. Is she's not the typical white woman like Elizabeth. Um, and I see her like um, she will bring people together. And that's what we need. Jessica? If the election were today, 
I would, I would vote for Joe Biden. I work for the Obama campaign. I have a lot of positive feelings towards the Obama-Biden years. I feel like everybody says, oh, we need to go forward. We don't want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back to those eight years. I think that those eight years were some of the, the best eight years that we've ever had as a country. Um, and so I feel like when you're scared, and I'm scared, um, and when you're worried, you want to go home. And to me, Joe Biden is home. We're doomed. <laughs> uh, okay. First guy said Elizabeth Warren. I can respect that just based on his position. That was the guy that said, look, I'm going to have this student loan debt until I die. Elizabeth Warren is proposing a student loan debt cancellation plan. It's not 100% cancellation like Jill Stein or Wayne Massam, but nonetheless, it's still a phenomenal plan. I have been practically begging Bernie to get on board with something like this. He didn't. So now Elizabeth Warren swooped in and she filled that space and it's benefiting her. So I can understand that one. Then the next lady... She talks about all these people she admires, Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, but then ultimately she says she's opting for Joe Biden because he has a vision. Take a moment and ask yourself, what is that vision? Because I don't know what his vision is. Do the same policies as Trump for the most part, maybe nominally better, but for the most part, do what he's doing Meddle in Venezuela, continue the drone war, but do it nicely while not doing mean tweets. What is that vision? Like Hillary Clinton, he doesn't have a vision. He's running because he's the vice president. He has the most name recognition. and He has a pretty solid chance of winning. But what is his vision? How will he actually benefit you what's his vision to make your paychecks bigger to make sure that people don't have to live paycheck to paycheck so i would like to follow up because i genuinely like i'm not trying to be a condescending prick in asking these questions i'm asking earnestly i want to know like i want to pick their brains further and ask them because these are the people who we need to be reaching out to but more on this the next guy says that he is opting for Kamala because she is a good contrast with Donald Trump and can win. Again, pretty vague. If you said that Kamala has a really good policy when it comes to decriminalizing sex work and I'm on board with that, that would make sense to me. But I mean, what policy is making you want to support her? Because if you all acknowledge that the economy isn't working because there's been a lack of policy to tend to these issues that need to be addressed, then why would you not think that a policy solution would be the most appropriate? I just, I genuinely am confused. The next girl said Kamala because not only is she a woman, she's a woman of color, she has the energy and a plan to go up against Donald Trump. Okay. The next guy says Kamala is better than Warren because she represents something else. She's not a typical white woman. Kamala will bring people together, so largely based on identity. Um, okay. Now the last woman, I want to read the quote to you, what she said specifically, because even if you don't agree, what she's telling us is something that's important that we need to hear, because this should be something that we address when making our pitch for Bernie. She says, I have a lot of positive feelings towards the Obama Biden years. Everyone says we need to go forward, not back. I want to go back. When you're worried, you want to go home. And to me, Joe Biden is home. Now, I get that this is contradictory because if you acknowledge that people are struggling and, you know, maybe that's largely the reason why Trump was elected, why would you want to go back to a time when nothing was getting accomplished? Now, I get that you can say, you know, maybe Obama could have done more, but he 
was working against obstructionist Republicans that didn't want any of his agenda to be implemented. But then I'd respond by saying, well, he had a supermajority for the first couple of years. And maybe him not capitalizing on that opportunity to pass sweeping reforms, maybe it made people feel less inspired. So what she's saying here, it doesn't make sense to me. But what she's doing is she's rationalizing her support for Joe Biden. He's the safe bet to her. He makes her feel nostalgic about a better time. And this is really what I suspected voters who support Biden Biden would say. They would vocalize this. They'd say Biden is someone who he brings back these feelings of American political stability and just decorum and people, you know, feeling safe and not having to worry about what the president tweets every single morning. So these are people who they're well-intentioned, right? These are not bad people, even if what they said is seemingly contradictory and absurd in 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 many ways. <laughs> I don't want to call them absurd, but the reason why I think we need to not just laugh at them and try to tailor our message to them is because if we don't get these people on our side, we lose. We have to convince these people that if you're worried about the state of the economy for normal Americans. We've got to get in a candidate who wants social democracy, who will fundamentally change the system, or at least put us on that trajectory of changing the system. We need to convince them that if we get another status quo neoliberal candidate, then this could lead to another Donald Trump, and that maybe the conditions that led to Donald Trump had something to do with Democrats not being bold enough not inspiring the base to get out and vote for them. So this is what I hope we'll take away from this as progressives, as brothers of the Bernard, that we don't shame these people, we don't laugh at them, because this is the rationalizations that we should be hearing about, because we can't just assume that, oh, well, they support Joe Biden because they're vapid. This is their line of thinking, and we've got to find ways to respond. We've got to tailor our message to them so that way what we are saying resonates because they're not shutting the door to Bernie. A lot of them, like that one lady who said she supports Joe Biden, she said, I like Bernie. So these are winnable people, and it would behoove us to not just shrug and say these people are misinformed because I think genuinely they are misinformed about the broader issues and the conditions that led to Donald Trump, but don't laugh at them convince them, win them over. That's what we've got to do because if we lose, that's on us. It's incumbent on us to win these people over. And that's what I hope that people will realize and that's what I hope people will try to do. They're winnable. They're gettable. They're not foolish people. They are rationalizing it in a way that doesn't make sense to me, but nonetheless, this is their rationalization and we've got to listen and try to respond in a way that gets them to our side. The Alabama State Senate just tried to sneak through one of the most insane, draconian, and brazenly unconstitutional anti-abortion laws yet. And we all know that this week, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed, I believe, the fourth heartbeat bill in the nation into law. So they're getting more and more extreme. But what they introduced and tried to push through in the Alabama State Senate is bananas. So as Arlen Parsa explains... This bill that they're trying to push would make nearly all abortions a felony, punishable up to 99 years in prison. So, I mean, what we're seeing here is them basically trying to emulate the theocratic regimes in the Middle East. So this is them living up to the expectations of the religious extremists in the TV show The Handmaid's Tale. And if you haven't watched it, basically... It's a show about what would happen if Mike Pence was a dictator and was able to implement whatever he wanted in the United States. That's basically what the show is about in a nutshell. And we're kind of seeing that play out here. Now, what's crazy about this is not only does it demonstrate how tyrannical the Republican Party is becoming, but they tried to pass this without even holding a roll call vote. So, I mean, when they tried to push this through, you're going to see, I'm going to play you a video here, where the other lawmakers were like, what are you doing? Wait, stop. You you can't do this. So take a look because shit got crazy.
That is just unreal. Now, thankfully, the bill was delayed. If I had to guess, I'd say it probably will ultimately end up passing. And they're just completely at this point disregarding the Constitution, disregarding Supreme Court precedent, disregarding Roe and Casey. They don't care because they are trying to provoke a constitutional challenge. That's what they want because they ultimately would like to see Roe v. Wade overturn. This is what they're doing. I've talked about this in the video that I made about Brian Kemp signing the heartbeat bill into law. And this is what states across the country are trying to do, which is why we're seeing so many heartbeat bills pop up. Now, with the Georgia law, where he essentially signed a bill into law, Brian Kemp, that is, that effectively banned abortions after six weeks. Think about how insane that is. Just step back and think about that. So if you are two weeks late on your period and you're a woman, you can't have an abortion. How bizarre is that? How insane is that? It is a fetus that has not developed a nervous system, is not capable of feeling pain, is not viable outside of the womb. And a woman may not even know she's pregnant, but it's already too late for her to have an abortion. That is fucking insane. It's insane. And anytime I post one of these videos, I love how the conservatives always comment saying, oh, well, you're just a baby killer, Mike. Oh, okay, so you're pro-life and you have more credibility, right? So why aren't you screeching about the bombs that we're giving to Saudi Arabia to drop on babies in Yemen? That's okay right? So I think that what you need to understand if you aren't able to fathom why liberals don't like this and think that you're a hypocrite is because you have no problem when Donald Trump murders babies and children in the Middle East and North Africa and drones them. But when it comes to fetuses, that's what you would care about. So maybe if you were more consistent in your quote unquote pro-life position, people would actually take you more seriously. But because you're an idiot and you were duped by what is obviously a wedge issue, an, uh, an issue that Republicans are trying to exploit, well, you think we're the baby killers. No, motherfucker, you're the baby killers. Stop voting for baby killers like Donald Trump, who's dropping bombs on the Middle East and North Africa, who killed an American girl in his very first military raid that he botched. He's currently loosening the restrictions on the rules of war, so they don't have to worry about killing innocent civilians. And you're going to care about undeveloped babies? You're going to talk about fetuses? Get the fuck out of here. I mean, the hypocrisy from the right is mind-boggling to me. If you're pro-life, you've got to be consistent, buddy. Otherwise, you don't get to call yourself pro-life. Ben Shapiro will rant and rave about this and how this is the moral thing to do. Meanwhile, I'll go back to 2002. He has articles where he literally talks about not giving a shit about civilians that are being killed. Now he'll say, you know, I was young, I was naive, and I've since moved away from that. Well, you still like wars. You still support every single war. So you don't get to call yourself pro-life and support wars, or at least remain silent when it comes to wars, or even if you're not as equally outraged about wars, because I would just respectfully disagree with you if you didn't support abortion, but you were at least consistent in your view, and you also rejected wars. But conservatives don't do that. They don't do that, and then they have the nerve to call liberals baby killers. So this is just infuriating, and we all know why they're doing it. This is about the end game. They want Roe v. Wade overturned, and this is just a means to an end. They know that these policies can't stand because they're against the Constitution, but their goal is to change that permanently. Hello, everyone. I'm here with a very special guest, the meme god himself, former senator from Alaska, current 2020 presidential candidate, Senator Mike Gravel. Senator Gravel, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, thank you for having me. I was just complimenting Senator Gravel before he came on about his Twitter game, and he tells me that this isn't actually him, which is a little bit disappointing, but nonetheless, whoever's running your Twitter, they're amazing. I just got to start by giving them the kudos there. Well, not only that, uh, they're articulating via their own intelligence and, and betting uh, the issues that we both agree on. So there's nothing at variance. It's just that you've got uh, younger persons, uh, certainly more enthusiastic and, and uh, more energy than I can muster at this point in my life. So 
<laughs> it's good. It's good. It is. I want to talk to you about that because this originally to run for president. I mean, this wasn't your idea. This is something that was brought to you by individuals who wanted you to run after they saw your performance in the 2008 debates. And for those of you who haven't seen this, I'm going to play a short clip of Senator Gravel basically railing against Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. And this is the clip that initially got me on board because I was a little iffy at first. Like, who's this Mike Gravel guy? Watch this clip and then you're going to understand why there's so much hype around him. Senator Gravel, at a forum earlier this year, I want to get this right. You said it doesn't matter whether you are elected president or not. So then why are you here tonight? Shouldn't debates be for candidates who are in the race to win the race? Ryan, you're right. I made that statement. But that's before I had a chance to stand with them a couple, three times. It's like going into the Senate. You know, the first time you get there, you're all excited. My God, how did I ever get here? Then about six months later, you say, how the hell did the rest of them get here? <laughs> you know, and, and I got to tell you, after standing up with them, some of these people frighten me. They frighten me. When, when you have mainline candidates that turn around and say that there's nothing off the table with respect to Iran, that's code for using nukes, nuclear devices. I got to tell you, I'm president of the United States. There will be no preemptive wars with nuclear devices. To my mind, it's immoral, and it's been immoral for the last 50 years as part of American foreign policy. Let's use a little moderator discretion here. Senator Gravel, that's a weighty charge. Who on this stage exactly tonight uh, 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 worries you uh, so much? Well, I would say the top tier ones. The top tier ones. They made statements. Oh, Joe, I'll include you too. You have a certain arrogance. You want to you wanna tell the Iraqis how to run their country. I got to tell you, we should just play get out. Just play get out. It's their country. They're asking us to leave, and we insist on staying there. And why not get out? What harm is it going to do? Oh, the, you hear the statement, well, my God, the soldiers will have died in vain. The entire deaths of Vietnam died in vain. And they're dying in vain right this very second. You know what's worse than a soldier dying in vain? is more soldiers dying in vain. That's what's worse. Okay, so let me ask you this, Senator. What was it that made you agree to this? Because if I were in your shoes, if I were 88 years old, I if these kids came up to me and said, hey, let's run for president, I'd tell them, no way. So what made you believe that this was the right decision? When they called, and it was David Oaks that called and asked me if I'd run for president, and I said to David with a snicker, uh, David, do you realize how old I am? And uh, I'm 88, but I'll be 89. I'm, I'm 89. I'll be 89 next week, uh, next Tuesday, my birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, and so uh, what D David did, I, I was really not into it, but uh, David sent me a... Uh, a communication that included the list of issues that he was concerned with. Uh, and at the top of the list was the issue of creating a legislature of the people. So that's what I've been working on for the last 25, 30 years. And so when I saw that, uh, saw that at the top of his list, uh, I, I, he really got my attention at that point in time. And so now it became a question of how we're going to do this. And, uh, and so he asked if he could use, uh, have access to my Twitter. Well, I developed a Twitter in the 08 uh, presidential period and also Facebook. I never used them. Uh, I'm just not into uh, tw tweeting, as they say. And so I had no problem in giving him access. It, it, it took a lot of activity to be able to get them authorized to do this. But, but it was a question of my just trusting him and trusting his associate, Henry Williams. Uh, and, and there's nothing that they've done to cause me to question that decision that I made. Uh, in point of fact, I'm just so proud of the way it's done. They gave me originally uh, veto proof on anything that they were doing. I've only exercised it once, and that was, uh, well, twice. One was to not use the F word, uh, which obviously I use. I use privately. I don't, I, but I, but I don't think it's a, it's a good public image for them or my my campaign to have. The other was <clears throat> to limit the amount of negative on on other candidates. Uh, we we need to get our message across. We don't need to address 
the other messages. But but it's a normal situation of critiquing uh, some of these other candidates when they go too far. And so I don't I don't mind doing that. I don't really want them to do that, but uh, but I think I can do it uh, and get away with it. Uh, because they can critique me if they want. There's, uh, there's no barrier to that at all. Sure. So that's how we, we, we got in. And what confirmed it with me was I had friends that would call me and say, God, Gravel, you're just doing a great job on Twitter. And I said, well, a great job is being done by these kids because they <laughs> understand the issues that, uh, that float my boat and they're exercising their judgment in amplifying those issues in an intelligent fashion. I can't tell you how fortunate I am. David Oaks is 17 years old. He's just wow. finishing high school and going to go on to Oxford. Uh, Henry Williams is a freshman in uh, uh, at Columbia, and all the others are young. Plus, they, they admit to me that there are professionals that have contacted them and said, we want to help, pro bono. And, and they admit that a lot of these professionals know a lot more about campaigning than they do. But by the end of this exercise, they'll be pretty sophisticated on campaigns uh, and as we go forward. Sure. So How, it, let me ask it, you it was, this, it was, Senator. Break, it was the break that, that we really needed because we need to bring attention to the empowerment of the people. Right. Uh, I often use the comparison that what's the most important virtue that a person could possess? Well, most important one is courage. If you don't have courage, you won't have the tools to implement the other virtues that you may have. And so it's the same thing. What's, what's the most important thing in human governance? The law. The law. We all live under the law. And so we give a monopoly to representative government in lawmaking, uh, both in lawmaking and amending the Constitution. So if you're ever going to want to see a change, a fundamental change in representative government, you're going to have to become a lawmaker. And I have the whole procedure to bring that about with a constitutional amendment and with a, uh, a, a federal statute, which is the, legis the legislative procedures to which the people will be empowered to act upon. So. That, that's what floats my boat. I've been at it for 25, 30 years, and that's what the, the kids understood as to how to get me involved in running for president was to be able to exercise uh, a communications process to bring people's attention to that the answer is not just electing somebody to public office. The answer is to empowering themselves to make laws in partnership with their representatives. Right, and I... I certainly can get on board with that. But I want to ask you, where are you guys at? Because you need 65,000 individual donors to get you on the debate stage so you can put this agenda front and center. So where are you guys at approximately in that process? Well, all I can do is give you an approximation. Sure. Because I don't follow it on a daily basis. They do. And we're talking about, oh, probably maybe 25,000, 30,000 signatures. So we're probably halfway there. Okay. And, uh, and so what we've learned is that uh, we could, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, I, I, I lost my, uh, the point. I had what you call a senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, so go ahead. what I want to ask you is I want to play devil's advocate here because on one hand, I do understand the need to take what you're saying to a national stage. But on the other hand, certainly in my lifetime, this is probably the best crop of presidential candidates because we have a number of really progressive people running who I support and admire, you know, Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, Elizabeth Warren. So let me ask you this. What do you say if somebody says, well, Mike, I see what you're doing, but you're just taking time away from the candidates who actually want to be president. How do you respond to that objection? Very simply, because I have a better uh, concept of what needs to be done. Here, Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie, and to some degree Warren, <laughs> I endorse wholeheartedly. I donated to Bernie last last election, and I think that Tulsi has the, the finest gravitas and, and the delivery of, of intellectual ideas of anybody I've ever heard of. But now, what is it that I bring to the table? I'm not sucking up their oxygen, because obviously... 
uh, I won't win any more than 20 some odd others will, won't win. They're not going anywhere. Mm. Uh, but so what's important is, let's say Bernie's got an agenda. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he's going to get his agenda enacted if the Democrats don't get a hold of the Senate? What's going to happen to his agenda? Yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. Absolutely. That's right. So, so, if, so even if they got the uh, Senate, when the last time the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate was when they passed Obamacare. At the time that it came out of the committee, uh, 70% of the Americans wanted the public, uh, the, uh, the public option. They never put it there. They made the judgment that, well, oh, uh, we don't think we can sell that. That's crap. If you don't reach out, you'll never get it. And so what I'm advocating is that, that, that we, we elect the progressives, the most progressives to office, which would be Bernie and Tulsi in my mind, uh, and then we equip them with the ability to get their uh, agenda enacted into law. It's not going to be the Congress. It's going to have to be the American people who are going to be able to make laws. So if you ask the American people, uh, are you for single-payer health care? No, win overwhelmingly. Mm-hmm. Are you for doing away with the uh, uh, the uh, the? Well, well, let me let me get some issues out that that I would uh, uh, continue. Uh, uh, do you want to repeal the electoral college? You think that would pass by the people? Yeah. And of course, that would benefit cleaning up elections. Uh, then uh, I want term limits for all federal judges. You know, so if we got a bunch of bad judges on the Supreme Court, the sooner we can turn limit them, the sooner we can clean that up. Mm-hmm. And then you can go on to other issues, uh, like uh, the the right. It should be in the Constitution: the right to health care, the right to education, the right to economic security. These should be in the Constitution of the United States. I've got a process to bring this about, and and all it is, it's a it's a constitutional amendment and a Legislative Procedures Act that is enacted by the people. The Congress will never enact this. The elites who control our society will fight this tooth and nail. Mm-hmm. But with the constitutional amendment that I have designed, we don't have to worry about them. So basically well, your goal is to get them to adopt this amendment that will empower the people. This reminds me of, I don't know if you've heard of Wolfpack. It's essentially a constitutional constitutional amendment to get money out of politics and their goal is to get two-thirds of state legislatures to sign on to this to get a constitutional convention and basically ban money from politics is this kind of similar to that in strategy hell no hell no with all with all due respect to these people it's a fool's errand if you're going to provide a if you're going to go to the trouble of getting a constitutional amendment Mm -hmm. you better empower the people to be able to make other amendments Mm -hmm. so if you do this one and of course what they're trying to do is to is to control money via law that's not going to happen you control this process by a constitutional amendment and that's what they failed to do and well, so that's we, what Wolfpack is about. They do want to ban it by constitution, like ban money in politics. Well, how, are they gonna get the, how are they going to get the constitutional amendment enacted? Well, with the two thirds of state legislatures, that's the strategy. That's, so I'm asking which, if that's your. What they're talking about is Article five. Yes. Which is a monopoly, which is a monopoly by representative government to deny the people to amend the constitution. So how would you so, go about getting a constitutional amendment? Oh, is what I'm trying simple. to get at. We, we get a group of people that, uh, that accept the text of a constitutional amendment and they go out and raise several hundred million dollars and conduct a national election that will permit people to vote to empower themselves to make laws. And at the same time as they do that, they turn around and they equip the people with the Legislative Procedures Act so that just, just enacting the people to make laws without deliberative procedures is creating anarchy. And so this is where a lot of these people fall off the rails in, in not thinking through this whole process. And I don't say this with disrespect. Sure. Uh, I say this with the fact that I have 12 years of elective office. Uh, I am a history buff, and I've been at this for 30 years. But how this do you get them table. to even get this on the ballot? Because we can't have a national referendum. Oh, so first, do you go to but, states? But what do you say that again now? So how do you get 
your constitutional amendment? Because if you're saying that you want people to vote to give them the power, well, how do you do that? Because you can't do this federally, so you have to go state by state. So well, I'm just curious about the strategy. You, well, first off, you've got to not do it federal, because if you did it within the government of representatives, you're going to get sabotaged. Do you think for a minute the elites would, would permit their uh, employees to go ahead and, and get involved in this without sabotaging it? We see this with initiative laws across the country. Well, and we can't but, have a federal referendum is what I'm saying. So how do you, well, so, how do, you do this? You, wait, so why can't you have a, first off, it's not a referendum. Referendums are what government feeds to the people. What we're talking about is people taking the initiative so you and I mm -hmm. and a few of our friends, we decide that we're going to be the group that's going to go out and create an opportunity for the people to vote on this subject. So what does that mean? That we've got to raise, a voting a national election is going to cost millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So we've got to raise a lot of money. But if there's people committed to this, that money will come forward. So now what we do is we take this proposal, a constitutional amendment, and a Legislative Procedures Act, an amendment and a law, and we put that before the people, and we raise the money to be able to put it before the people, and we use the modern technology very simply. Do you want to be empowered to make laws like the people who hold a monopoly on that process today in representative government? That's a question to you. Yeah. Do you want to, do you, do you want, and of course, you yes. would vote yes because you're informed. Yes. I would vote yes. Now, we've got to get We've got to get a standard. We've got to get at least 50% of the people plus one who voted in the last presidential election. We're talking to 70, 80 million people. And, and we can leave it. We can leave the, the election going on. So maybe 100 million people want to vote to empower themselves to make laws. The minute we read the standard of what elects a president, we then declare this the law of the land. And I would like to see the politicians, basically as a group, they're cowards. I'd like to see them go ahead and fight the people, 80% of the people who want to be empowered to make laws. It's, it's going to be Katie bar the door. Now, when you say <clears throat> that the elites will campaign against, of course they'll campaign against this. But they got to turn around and get the message across that you are too dumb to be able to make laws. Let, let, these, let these representatives that you don't know anything about manipulate you into voting for them. Mm -hmm. And so the only time you have power is on election day when you go into the booth and you click the switch. That's it. After that, you're stuck. All you got to do is beg, plead, and protest for the next two, four, and six years. And I, now, I like this idea of empowering people, but here's the problem that I have. How do you sell this to people within 30 seconds or a minute on a debate stage? Because it's it's a relatively complex scheme to kind of just pull off. So how do you condense that message and get to the debate and explain it to people so that way, one, they understand it, not just what it is, but also the strategy? How do you do that? Because this seems extremely complicated. Well, do you know something? Have you focused on the details of how you make laws in Congress? That's very complicated. Yeah. That's all I've copied. That's exactly what I've copied in the Legislative Procedures Act, and I've tweaked it so it works for 100 million people. So if you're prepared to say, oh, this is too complicated, but then what you're doing right now is even more complicated and dysfunctional. Sure. So what you can say is, do, do, people, do people want to pay that much? No, they don't want to pay that much attention to it. But enough people hopefully will pay enough attention to it because you want to correct what's going on. You know that the government's dysfunctional right now. So what are you going to do? <laughs> Elect another body of people that, uh, that, that act no differently than they've been acting for the last 100 years, 300 years? You know, you stop and think. Science and, uh, has moved ahead from the discovery of the, the at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Science has moved ahead with discovery and change beyond our imaginations. Mm -hmm. What about the structure of government? It hasn't moved an inch beyond the, the, its founding in 1787. And, and what it was then was a device to perpetuate slavery and set up the device for genocide against the indigenous people of the continent. This is just the beginning. And so what you see, the, the murderous imperial society that we control today, 
no different than what it used to be. So what we need to do is to advance human governance to the level that we have scientific advancement. And, and we have to do that, otherwise we'll commit suicide. And that's because of the advance scientifically in the nuclear capability of planetary destruction. Right. And look, I'm on board with this idea. I know you're on board, but, but you wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and I'm, I'm definitely interested, but I'm just trying to think about this in terms of how you really get that attention that you want. I mean, do you drop a web address and say, go to senatorrafael.com? No, I, 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 I do what I'm doing right now. I'm talking to you. Right. You have influence within your footprint. But and on a that, debate stage, on that national stage, when the spotlight's on you and they say, Senator Gravel, explain this, are you going to say, well, look, here's just the quick rundown, but for more info, go to, you know, MikeGravel.com. Like, what I'm failing to grasp is, how do you sell this to people? I mean, the American people, for the most part, they're misinformed by propagandists, you know, corporate media. A lot of people think Judge Judy's on the Supreme Court. So how do you get something like this across to people in a very precise way when it's so difficult, when you're going to be up against other candidates, when the moderator is going to want to cut you off? How do you cut across that? How do you get this across? Well, real simple. First off, I'm under no delusions. I get into debates. I'll be lucky if I get six Five, five, six, seven minutes. Yeah. What, what oh, can no. you do in that period of time? Yeah. Do you think I can explain the whole legislative procedure, the way the Congress works? No. <laughs> of course not. So, so what you, do, what I, what I do is what I've been doing. I try to articulate it as best I can, so that people can be aware of it. So I can talk about issues like the nuclear suicide pact that our nation is on, mm -hmm. or how the suicide pact exists for the implosion of the planet as a result of the environmental problems that we're not addressing. So I can, I can talk to those and, and also point forward that, look at you're not happy the way things are going? Not you're being ruled by a minority, mm -hmm. okay? I'm talking about ruling by majority of the people. Now, if you don't want to buy into that, that's your problem. All I can do is do the best I can, and that may not be adequate. It hasn't been adequate for the last 30 years, and it may not be for another 30 years. But it may be, maybe just right now, that the people are so fed up with the crap of, of what's going on in Washington and the government that maybe they would take a look over there and say, hey, maybe there's something to what Gravel is saying. So I don't know. All I can do is the best I can. Sure. But the communications responsibility is yours. I'll have a book out in midsummer. You take that book and you understand it. Read it through two or three times. Here, it took me 30 years to get this on the table, mm -hmm. and, and, and it would be the height of arrogance to think that you can read through what I've spent 30 years at, and you can understand it totally. Yeah. No, what you do is you go in and you ask questions, and if I'm still around, I'll be responding to those questions in great detail. What we need is to get this book, and the title says it all, Human Governance, the Failure of Representative Government, and a Solution quote, the people. There's only two venues for change. One is the government, which is dysfunctional and rules us by a minority of elites. And the other is the people. And the people don't have the power to make laws because that was categorically designed to not permit the people to make laws by the framers of the Constitution because they knew the people would not buy into slavery. And we have the example of what happened in Massachusetts to prove that. So, so since the founders got it wrong, and, and so it's, it really serves the elites who control us as a minority to, to lionize the, the founders that walk on water. They didn't walk on water. They were elites that provided for their own sustained power and the continuation of their power by, by their progeny. Right. This is what, 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 what we have. And, and I'm not denigrating them. I'm just saying they were human beings like we have human beings today. So and basically, that's not enough. We need, and, and it's to understand, this is where you can help. Understand what is the central power of government, any government. It's always it's the people. Law. No, no, it's the law. The people live under the law. So now the question becomes, who makes the law? Well, under the representative government, which is all we have in the world today, don't talk to the tyrants, forget them. Just representative government. The people who make the law have a monopoly on making law. Those are the people you elect. 
And so the point I was making with you is that on election day, the only power you have is to give your power away. Mm-hmm. Now, the, and so once it's gone, all you can do is write a letter to your congressman, the protest in the streets over what they're not doing right, uh, you know, go through the charade, or elect some more people to public office who are stuck into... See, it's not that we're electing bad people. Well, there's a lot of them. There's mm, enough of them. Yeah, it's sad. Probably disagree with that. McConnell <laughs> and, and family, bad people. but uh, Or Trump, bad people. But no, what what's going on is is that, that we... Uh, here, I, I just got another senior moment. I forgot the point I was making. Well, listen, I'll just... I'll say this because I'm on board with it. And what I'm kind of grasping is that this is essentially to plant a seed to get people thinking about power structures differently, to get them to think about governance and really self-governance differently. And, and I can absolutely respect that. My the, the way that I'm thinking about this in terms of how you sell this is all about your debate strategy on that stage, because basically this is what your campaign is about. So let me shift gears a little bit here. So One of the things that I disagree with you with is your stance on 9-11 being an inside job. I actually don't want to talk about that because you actually had a pretty lengthy... I do if you disagree. Well, no, no, no. Listen, you talked to David Pakman about this for about 17 minutes, and I think that basically... I heard it. Yeah, I watched it. And I agree more with David Pakman than I do you, to be honest. However, let me say this. I don't care... Like you and that's not a deal breaker for me, because what I want is for you to get your message and your platform across, because I think if you have a robust platform, I don't care if you have these other views that I disagree with. But let me ask you this. Strategically speaking, you're going to be called on. And the first question that they're going to ask you, we both know it. It's going to be Senator Gravel. You've made some controversial remarks. You claim that you have no doubt that 9-11 is an inside job. How do you respond to that question on a debate stage? Real simple. I say, are you not aware of the fact that the commission that was created by Bush was first to be chaired by Henry Kissinger? Does that not give you an inkling that there was something going on? That he was he was acceptable because he's the classic cover your behind government. The second thing is going to be, does it not disturb you that the commission never even acknowledged the existence of Building 7 coming down by controlled demolition? Does that not raise a question? Does it not raise a question that this was the excuse that the neocons put forward to be able to, as they articulated in a letter, to be able to have a a situation like the Pearl Harbor to energize the people to fight the war uh, against uh, terror? which is not a war, which is a war for infinity, does it not disturb you a little bit to wonder when you follow the money that the chief beneficiaries of 9-11 are the military industrial complex? Does that make you suspicious? But All Senator- I'm asking for, wait a second, let me finish. All I'm asking for is that we have a new commission to look at this. We had three commissions look at the pres- with Kennedy assassination. What's so wrong? Sure, I say it's an inside job. I don't know who the insiders are. I'd like a commission to look at this again and maybe tell me who the insiders are. Well, this is what's so wrong with that? Why can't you accept that? another commission, not of politicians? I would insist that members of the commission, the last three president heads of the United Nations, should be on that commission, and scientists. Uh, and not politicians. We don't need any more politicians covering our backside. What we need is to going after the truth. And but right Senator, now, yes. The ahead. whole point in me asking you this hypothetical is to see how you would answer that question. And I think that you and I both know that the way that corporate media works is they don't want to give you the time to talk about your platform. So what I was hoping that you would do if that question came up is completely dodge it, swat it away, and jump straight to your platform, not even get into it, because to me, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't care about that position. You know what I mean? Good so advice. Good advice. And I'll tell you what, when you see me in debates, I'll, I'll, I'll assert myself. With all due respect, that's not the question you should be asking me. Yeah, does that'd that be... Like, does that sound like a good way to handle it? I think that would be fantastic, because this is the way that I... When I hear you talk about this, I think, okay, I disagree, but... I, it's not a, like I said, it's not a deal breaker. I don't care enough because your platform is what I care the most about. But the initial thing that worried me was that this is the one thing that we're going to take away from this debate. They're not going to let you get out the rest of your platform. They're not going to let you talk we'll about your agenda. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how the debate goes. 
But if you get a taste of what the way the debate goes, just look at the last debate. Right, which is why I'm also I, I am right. confident. Yeah, well, what I'm living on, what I'm living on, and what the what our campaign is living on is what I said in the last last debate. And isn't it interesting that all of the problems that we had at the last debate before Obama got elected and now Trump, that nothing has changed. Yeah. Does that does that give you a message as to have, let's have another election, get all these people elected to can do all these things? They can't do these things. They, Obama wasn't able to do it. Trump is even worse. So what we what we need is a new device, a new structure that permits the issues that we want to be dealt with to be dealt with. That's what and I want you to say device. on the debate huh? stage. That's what I want you to say on the debate stage, regardless if they ask you. About because they they want to get like they want to draw you in so you just talk about nine eleven you talk but that's what I think would really be something that makes this a success is if you don't even you pretend as if you're the host of that debate and you just take charge and you talk about your platform I think that is what I want to see isn't that what I did in 08? that's exactly <laughs> what you did in 08. so I just oh, want to make I sure have, we replicate I that you, I, I just want to confess to you I haven't changed good <laughs> I haven't got a little older. Little, little, every so often I'll have some senior moments, but I think people will understand the senior moments Every, because they don't detract. That. They don't detract from the message. We all have brain message. parts. What I was harking back uh, eleven years ago, uh, and I had a book, Citizen Power, and uh, and I'll have another book out that I can point to, and here is the blueprint to solve the problem. Good. And so, we, your your assessment is spot on, spot on. And, and so you, you, you've got to understand that you have a venue of communication mm -hmm. and you're using that venue. And now by trying to get into what I'm talking about in human governance, that you're using that venue that I think it is a very positive way. So, so don't, don't worry about the fact that well, how the people are going to get this. You just keep communicating. Absolutely. And, and the people, I've learned a long time ago, the people are not dumb. Yeah, not yeah. at all. Not they're, at all. Very, they're very bright and knowledgeable. All they got to do is focus on the issue. And so it's so tough to make a living today and raise a family and all of that, that they don't have time to reflect. But, but now if you put things in front of them, they'll begin to reflect on it. Now, no question, we got... 25% of the people that may be dumb as fence post, I don't know, but the base <laughs> of uh, Trump is there. But then you've got 75% of the people that are open, open. Yeah, they, they're just misinformed a lot of the time by cable news, course, misinformation. The problem, is, we said, the problem is mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Who owns mainstream media? <laughs> it's the yeah. military industrial complex. The, when they, and, and they sneak stuff in. They, they put forth some, pack, some facts that if you understand the dynamics of what's going on, you can use those facts against them. Uh, here, like right now, <clears throat> in the news today was uh, uh, Trump, which is Bolton and, uh, and uh, the Secretary of State, uh, a, a religious nut at best. Uh, they're the ones that are making the case that we've got to, that Iran is a threat to us. Mm -hmm. Iran's not a threat to us, never has been. We're the ones that damaged them when we took out Mossadegh, when they had a representative government. So no, but why today we're moving the fleet in to threaten and scare, uh, scare the leadership of Iran? Will they react? I hope not. When I was in Iran and was talking and made a couple of speeches and spoke to their intelligence community elements of it, I said, hey, just be patient. You know. We're very immature in what we're doing uh, as global imperialists. Just be patient. And, you know, there's the old saying that uh, what can the powerful do whatever they want? What can the people who don't have power, they suffer what they have to. And so that's where we're stuck. We are the global imperialists. And whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Iran, uh, you name it. Uh, and, 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 of course, we use our sanctions. Sanctions are a tool of war. That's and correct. so, and so, right now, we are murdering thousands of young children who are being denied medicines and economic survivability uh, in Venezuela. When you come back, when you compare that to what China has done by moving 600 million people from poverty to middle class, 
and you then read the papers about, oh, the threat is coming from China. That's just crap. That's just crap. China is, is in my mind, performing a better service to the global economy than is the United States because we're misusing the power we have with the dollar. And I'll tell you, the dollar being reserve currency is going to disappear. And because things are afoot to change that abuse of power that we have. And that's the foundation of how we can uh, sanction people, how we can uh, do things to them. And so once we don't have that power anymore, our sanctions won't be worth a thing. Right. Well, let me say this. The one thing that sold me on what you're doing is your debate performance in 2008. I actually feel bad that back in 2008, that was the first time I was old enough to vote. And for whatever reason, you weren't on my radar. Um, but I'm writing that wrong now. And second of all, the thing that I liked was your platform. The platform I said on my show is basically the gold standard. It's better than Bernie's. It's better than Tulsi's. It's better than Warren's. Your platform is phenomenal. So I don't want your platform to go away once this process is complete, once you go on the debate stage. So my one plea to you and your team is to put that platform online. Basically, if you can't get out what you need to, have people know that there's a resource. They can go to a website or a Twitter to see what you're talking about and what issues they're not being informed about. And with that being said, I will leave you with the last word to make your pitch to people as to why they should just chip in a buck to help you get on the debate stage. One, the, just go to the debates that occurred in 08. And if you like what I said then, you just like what I'm gonna say at the new debates. Secondly, to your other question, is what happens after the debates? Oh, there's going to be a continue. First off, I'll have a book out there that right. only, only deals with uh, direct democracy. It doesn't right. deal with, like, citizen power deal, as was a polemic, plus uh, direct democracy. This is only going to deal with that, and it's not going to be any more than 80 pages. So you could read it in one sitting, and if you want to then reread it again, because it will take, you're absorbing the concept of what's involved. Sure. And so that opportunity. Now, secondly, here we got David and uh, Henry and what they got uh, several hundred other supporters, including yourself, that you can now continue the battle, the campaign to educate the people. And so we will have uh, plans. I've got plans in my mind for these kids which have demonstrated their ability to organize and communicate. And that's what it takes to bring about a national election that will give you the opportunity to vote for a constitutional amendment and a legislative procedures act that will equip you to make laws to address the problems that you think are so important. All and right. I thank you for putting me on, and you've given me some good ideas. And I can assure you that uh, J David Oaks and, uh, and Henry will, will absorb them too. Uh, after the debates, they're going to be coming out here to visit with me, or, or I'll visit with them when I'm back east. But I don't intend to travel until it's to the debates. I'm keeping my powder dry. As, as what happened with William McKinley, who up until recently, you know, people went out and traveled. In the old days, you didn't. You sat at your front porch, and your minions went out there and sold you. <laughs> well, that's what's going on. I don't have a front porch, but I got a patio. So this is a right. patio campaign, uh, and uh, David is the uh, David and Henry are the co-chairmen, and they're doing a fabulous job. I rely on their judgment. So you'll see us again, and you'll see them again because you're going to want to interview them. They've got the message just as well as I've got the message. I look forward to covering their congressional campaigns. Absolutely. Um, so I look forward to you dunking on the corporate Democrats on the debate stage, Mike. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Mike Gravel, tell us your website. MikeGravel.org, O-R-G. Don't get mixed up. I've got MikeGravel.us, but uh, this is the campaign uh, one, and just go to that one, and you can contribute a dollar. I need you to contribute a dollar, and that's not much to pay to get me on a debate. I'll, I'll, I'll entertain you that much. You get a dollar for <laughs> me for sure. Okay. You you pay five dollars to rent a movie on Amazon. You could pay a dollar to watch Mike Gravel dunk on corporatists on a debate stage. Well said. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll leave that there. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
Well, that's all that I've got, guys. I hope you enjoyed the show. It's another long episode, but these are getting longer and longer. And I get that sometimes it's hard to listen to a soy boy cuck talk for like four hours at a time, but just break it apart. Break it apart. Listen to like half at one point and then the other half later. <laughs> or you can watch the segments. The segments are always broken up and put up on uh, YouTube every single week. So that's another way to do it. But regardless, for those of you who stayed and love the show, Thank you so much. Before we leave, I want to send a shout out and thank you to all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. And thank you to everyone who listens loyally every single week on iTunes and SoundCloud. That's it. I'm Mike Figueredo. This is the Humanist Report Podcast. I'll see you all next week. Take care.